Hit it. It's uh, Friday, April 29th, 2022, episode 177. I'm Patrick Serezna. And I'm Kevin Muir. This week, Macro Alf joins us to talk about markets. He tells us why he is short S&Ps, credit spreads, Italian BTPs, and most importantly, why pineapple pizza is a travesty that should be outlawed immediately. <laughs> then Patrick pulls out the crayons he is chewing on to see if he can make sense on what's happening in the markets. And this week, uh, we, uh, we do our segments of No Stupid Questions and uh, Skin in the Game. So stick around, folks. We've got a great show. Uh, Lena, hop on. What uh, beer am I uh, drinking this week? So this week, Patrick is drinking Prata Pilsner from Dois Corvos. Mm-hmm. Where are you, uh, our international man well, of mystery? I'm still in uh, Lisbon. Uh, we're gonna, actually going to be in Barcelona next week doing a little Spain. I'm going to grab a, a sh- some beers uh, to bring back to uh, feature some uh, Spanish uh, craft beers. But okay. right now, uh, this is actually from um, up in Sintra, uh, a craft brewery up there. And uh, I was up there and uh, grabbed these. But I'll tell you, it's um, a little bit of a sweet taste to this Pilsner. I mean, it's a clean drinking Pilsner, but so far... Uh, Almost a little sweet, but uh, well, I'll judge it at the end of the show anyway. All right, so uh, uh, oh, before actually, we go Kev, any further, we, we, we have an we announcement. Have a, we do have an announcement. Go for Patrick, it. You, no, you take it. You, you do it. Okay. Well, those for the are interested in our uh, the uh, market huddle piss up that is being. It's like, happening. Long, too long in the making. It's finally happening. All we have so far is a date. We have committed to a date, June first. And city. And city, we know it's June first in Toronto. <laughs> yes, we are going to figure out uh, location for those that are from Toronto and have might have some ideas for us. Let us know. But for everyone that is pl- wants to come, book it happening tickets. June first. It's happening June no matter 1st. what. Even if we're just going to a bar and taking it over, it's happening June first. Uh, it'll start at what roughly right after the market closes. Yeah, uh, we're going to head to a bar and we're going to drink. It, by the way, we have to clarify, it is on a Wednesday, but we figured it was easier for us to take over a bar in the middle of the week than trying to push Well, not it on only that, we, we have our show and, to do on Friday. Exactly. And we want to have a full night of drinking, so it's got to start at 4 o'clock. <laughs> and uh, we're committed June 1st. Uh, book your flights. Come on down. Everyone's uh, welcome. We have a lot of pitchers of beer that we need to settle up, and there will be lots of alcohol consumed. I hope you guys can make it. All, All right, right, Lena, why don't you tell us about the merch store? Please show us some love by visiting our uh, merch store at markethuddlemerch.com. Nice. All right, let me do the disclaimer. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment <laughs> professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in the show. Side effects of too much huddle may include podcast infidelity, concussive market action, <laughs> and drinking alone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to our interview. Uh, it's our great pleasure to welcome back to the show, Alfonso. And I'm not even going to try your last name. And now I'm going to call you Macro Alf. Yeah, that's fair enough. That's why I went for it. <laughs> why did you tell people your last name so that I, I can I, I can at least have it in the back of my mind and pretend like I might be able to do it next time? So imagine you're on the Amalfi Coast and you're eating at the fish restaurant and then... Uh, Waiter comes in and he says, what's your name? And he goes like, Alfonso Pecatiello. Oh, it's so nice. It just rolls off your lips. Like, you're, it's <laughs> such a beautiful language. You know, my, you know, my favorite story about Italy is I have a buddy that uh, he w- travels a lot in Europe and he loves going uh, skiing. And he was skiing in one of these countries that is right beside Italy. And we won't say which one it was, but he was skiing there. And then he went and they were nice and they were fine. And then he went across the border to the other country, and which was Italy. And he said, I instantly felt like people were just more pleased with life. They were enjoying themselves. They were drinking more. They Just everything was friendlier once they crossed the border. Sounds very familiar. But <laughs> the north of Italy is still relatively cold. If you cross the other border of Italy, which is an imaginary border, which uh, starts more or less in Rome... And then you hit the south of Italy, then things become even warmer and more relaxed and way too relaxed sometimes, I need to say. Really? Oh, so the, the northern and the southern Italians, the, the, there's a difference in a kind of uh, attitude? Yeah. So I always say that if you go to uh, anywhere north of Tuscany, you are going to Austria or Germany. And if you go <laughs> anywhere south of uh, Rome, then you're going to Italy. But I'm just joking. I mean, I'm from the south, so I'm talking my book. And not only that, I think the Austrians and the Germans would take big offense to that. 
<laughs> that could be. So let's let's not go there. Let's not go there. Okay, so let's talk some uh, stocks because there's, uh, you know, uh, thank you so much for being on the show because I think it's a great time to have you on. A lot of people um, have been bullish for a long time, and for the first time in a while, we're seeing some cracks in the stock market and some some worries and and uh, some negative trades are starting to work. And I'd love to go through what you're seeing out there and some of the trades that you're kind of putting on. Let's just start with them. I was going through your letter and your tweets. One of the things is you're outright short the stock market with the short booze position. What's what's your reasoning and driving force behind that trade? Well, there are three positions I have on. One is S&P, the other is credit spreads by an ETF we're going to talk about later. And the other one is uh, BTP bonds, so short Italian government bonds and long German government bonds. But let's start from the from the S&P. They are yeah, all short risk assets trades anyway, Kevin. So I must be bearish on yep. risk assets, right? Which is true. And the very reason why I am is pretty simple because Powell told me to be. So who am I not to be? I mean, in, in uh, I think it was December already or January press conference, he went out and said, well, they asked him, you know, financial conditions are tightening. They went up by uh, whatever, one point on the Goldman Sachs financial condition index. What do you make of that? And he's like, what do you mean? What do I make of that? Financial conditions must tighten. That's what he said, literally in front of the wire. And so what that means for me is that the Federal Reserve, Kevin, has to try and kill demand because that's the only lever they have to try and slow down inflation. They can't make the ships stuck at the Shanghai port run faster. They, they can't make Russia export energy. They can't make Ukraine export neon or wheat or whatever. They can't do that. The only thing they can do is to slow demand. And it's not only a Fed problem, it's also an ECB problem by now. Core inflation was 3.5% in Europe, 3.5% core inflation. What's most impressive is that inflation swaps if you look at five year, so that's basically a market implied measure of what traders expect inflation to be in Europe and in the US over the next five years, it's three and a half percent. Both targets are around 2% from central banks. And moreover, if you look at the distribution of probability of these inflation swaps by looking at options, you realize that the right tail is actually getting fatter. There is more than 10% chance, according to traders, that inflation will print at 5% in the US over the next five years on average. Do you know what's the probability they attach to the chance that inflation will print at 2%, which happens to be the Fed target? 10%. What's 10%. So it's equal between 2 and 5 is, 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 is the same percentage. I mean, that's pretty scary. I think if you're, if you're a central banker, right, you're looking at market pricing, and yes, I mean, 5-year, five 5-year five forward are lower, the inflation curve is inverted. Yes, I know that. But 5 years is a pretty long period ahead of you for monetary policy. It can be you know, identified as the famous medium term for inflation expectations from a certain extent. You're looking at traders telling you that you have the same chance that you're actually going to hit your target, which is 2%, and the same probability you're going to hit 5% on average over the next five years. That doesn't sound good, does it? No. You know what I find fascinating about that, though, is that that right tail on longer-term inflation expectations, you are correct that it is getting fatter and in and, and a bigger risk to the markets. But that's a relatively new phenomenon, isn't it? It's like, you know, three, six months ago, the market assumed that the Fed would tighten, the economy would roll over, and, and we would be right back. And you're so right. So before I tell some bullshit that I don't want to tell, um, let me pull up for a second the, the chart here. Because if I look at the distribution of probabilities as we speak, so on the first, sorry, on the 5th of January 2022, the 90th percentile of the market implied probability distribution for US inflation over the next five years was 4%, not 5%, it was 4%. Right. And the 10th percentile on the left side of the, of the distribution was 1.65%. So people thought inflation could slow down below the Fed's target for the next five years. Small probability, 10%, but it could. And now we have moved to 2.2 and 53 Right. I mean, it, it is moving and it's becoming fatter pretty fast. And people, I mean, the, 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 um, the thing that the macro regime we're in, Kevin, I compare it and I started comparing it already in December last year to Q3, Q4, 2018. But this is worse. It's Q3, Q4, 18 on steroids. Because if you look at the same distribution in 2018, core PC in America was 2.2% back then. And the five-year implied probability distribution was centered at 2% and the fattest tail was at 2.5%, which is, 
which basically means, you know, inflation expectations were very well anchored. The Fed didn't need to, you know, put down any fire. And now they need to put down any, every, I mean, the fire there. It's becoming uh, much more scary and potentially the anchor for them. Right. And so that's the shift that's occurred, I would guess, in the last three months. And I, and one of the things that I completely agree with you is the Fed expressing their desire to have uh, financial conditions tighten is it's relatively explicit. And one of the things that kind of shocks me about uh, market participants is that they don't understand financial conditions is basically the stock market. Yeah, <laughs> there's credit spreads, there's other issues. But if we get financial conditions tightening, that means stocks are headed lower. That's pretty much true. So if you look at the composition of the financial conditions index, yeah, it's uh, real interest rates, the dollar, uh, and it's um, credit spreads, and it's equities. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that if you push the dollar higher, real interest rates higher, and credit spreads wider, then equities, of course, will fall. So obviously, they, they it's basically a risk asset basket, which is very overweight towards equities at the end of the day. If you start moving the, the bottom side of the capital structure ladder and you make it shaking, then obviously the top side as well, equities will fall. Yeah. So Powell basically told you, I mean, I, I want the two largest markets out there to reprice. And people might think those are the equity and the bond market, but in reality, those are the real estate market and the equity market. Now, I have a chart somewhere on the macro compass that shows that the, if you sum up residential real estate, commercial real estate, and agricultural land, the total market cap at the end of 2020 was somewhere like $300 trillion. You know how big is the global equity market? It's $100 trillion. So then why do you think that the Fed, is Powell, um, is targeting real estate? Because I will agree with you on the financial conditions part. And I will agree that most financial conditions, ultimately, whether it be credit spreads, the dollar or whatever, they're all correlated to stocks. So therefore, in essence, it ends up being a stock bet. I, I, I guess I'm not quite as sure as you are that he is also um, targeting lower real estate prices. Yeah, so the reason is that, as I was saying, the real estate market represents by far the largest uh, asset class in the world by market cap. It's about three times as big as the equity market and therefore also being so leveraged as an asset class because 85% of purchases happen to be backed by a mortgage in the US. It represents a large portion of the mark to market of the balance sheet of the consumers, Kevin. And so if you want to slow aggregate demand, then obviously the first thing you have to look at is try to make the balance sheet of the consumer sector a bit you know, down in, in mark-to-market terms. You need to make them less buoyant. You need to have less animal spirits going through the economy. You need to slow down demand, right? So the 401ks and the equity portfolio, there is research showing that if it drops by 20%, then there is some negative effect on consumer behavior with a lag. But on the real estate market, that's much bigger. And it's understandable because it's a levered asset class and it's generally much bigger as an impact on the balance sheet of consumers than it is equity markets. On top of that, if house prices would rise further, there is a pretty large risk that uh, the rent part, the shelter part of the inflation component might also go up. And if that goes up, it makes you know the life of the Fed even more difficult. So you basically achieve two objectives at once. Okay, so I see your argument is that if they are trying to dampen uh, demand, that is the actual way to do it is to make sure that housing prices stop going up and in fact, maybe even go down because it'll ultimately affect spending less. But here's a question I have for you, Alf. Do you really think the Federal Reserve is wanting to dampen demand as much as they seem to? Or are they really just trying to get, uh, gather time or, or earn time for the supply shift, uh, the supply constraints to be fixed up? Yes, yeah, so I'm not going to argue. In the first episode of the market, I think the title was I'm not a maximalist, and that's still true. So I'm not going to advocate there's going to be a breakdown and the sky is falling. Not really. But Kevin, uh, effectively, in the summary of economic projections at the last Fed meeting, they told you that they believe on their own projections that if they raise rates above neutral level, whatever that is, let's call it 2.5%, all right? They have the Fed funds projections at 2.8% for 2023 and 2024. So two full calendar years of Fed funds rate above what's supposed to be neutral. So that should be 
tight for the economy, right? right? Do you know? Do you remember what's the unemployment rate forecast for 2023 and 2024? No, I it's don't three remember. And a, the, it's, it's three and a half. They still have it so low. So how is it going to tighten things? Yeah, I mean, they basically think the private sector can take so much shit thrown at them. And therefore, they probably think, okay, first we have to hike and we have to move forward guidance. That's how you start moving things, right? You make yep. the euro dollar curve reprise, bond market reprise, real interest rates go up and all of that, right? And then after that, apparently, that's not going to be even enough to fully achieve their objective. So they, they probably think that they need to slow down demand a bit as well through the reverse wealth effect, which is basically um, fancy terminology for... Uh, housing prices, you know, not going up this year and equity markets possibly going down a bit as well. Oh, okay, of so, course, oh, sorry, go ahead, keep going up. No, sorry, sorry, Kevin, just the last thing is, yep. of course, it's not like um, if they get a hand from the real economy and demand is slowing, and most importantly, inflation shows signs of slowing down more than they already price in, because don't forget, the Federal Reserve expects core PCE at year end to be below 3%. So it needs to slow down and faster than their own projections. And then at that point, yeah, they're of course not going to kill the whole thing because they're achieving their objective. At this stage, they aren't though. Okay, so now let's just think this through. We we agree that the Federal Reserve is trying, is targeting asset prices, whether, whether they be stocks or whether they be real estate, in an attempt to slow it down so that all prices will come down. One of the things that I worry about is as they tighten policy conditions, it's gonna we're gonna tighten, 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 and then all of a sudden the market's gonna say, whoops. And although real estate might go down, real estate is a lot slower than stocks. So my question yeah. to you is what happens if we get a whoosh in the stock market and all of a sudden we're down 30%, yet Really, not much has changed in terms of the real economy with um, in terms of inflation and in terms of real estate. Do you think the Fed will at that point ease up and, and take their foot off the break? So you're asking me where is the Fed put? Yes. And, and I saw, listen, I saw you mention the other day that you said the Fed's buying puts now. Why don't you tell people what you meant by that? Because I thought it was an interesting way. I've said that they've been selling calls, but buying puts makes it makes a lot of sense as well. Yeah. So I think we agree on that, Kevin, as in the Fed put is a term that basically means the Federal Reserve is selling puts to the market, effectively providing a floor under asset prices, right? Because they, over the since the great financial crisis, the problem was always a lack of strong aggregate demand that could offset the globalization pressure, demographics pressure, technology pressure on the supply side of the equation and make inflation and inflation expectation anchor around 2%. So it was always the, the other problem. You needed financial conditions to ease the whole time. And therefore, the Fed was effectively providing the proverbial put and putting the floor behind any sell-off in risk assets. In 2017, I think the realized vol on SMB was like, I don't know, 12% annualized, something yeah, like it was, that. It was a record low, if I remember right correctly. Yeah. So here, here you go, right? And, and this time, I think it's the exact opposite. First of all, there is no visible Fed put at the moment. And second of all, I'm going to say that they actually are cheering to see the stock market reprice a bit further down. Now, because that will help them achieve their objective of slowing down demand. Obviously, if, and, and so answering your question, if equity markets drop 20, 30% from here, so you're talking 3,500 S&P, something like that, right? If that happens, then um, there are two scenarios. One is that you immediately see... Um, large dislocations when it comes to market functioning. And so I'm talking about repo, I'm talking about liquidity, I'm talking about companies not able to access credit markets anymore. And in that case, I think they will step in. They will step in because the imperative is to make sure the whole thing doesn't, you know, um, the sky doesn't fall. Okay? Right. No okay. policymaker has any incentive to make the sky fall. I mean, of course. But if things are still functioning, and let's assume that inflation is still higher than they thought it was. I mean, of course, there is a lag, right, between the risk assets going down and demand slowing, as you just said. I wouldn't expect them to, um, to come in with the old cavalry here. Um, it's a very different situation in 2019. People are basically telling me that, you know, if we get a 20% drawdown like we had in uh, Q4-18, then Powell would pivot straight away. 
But again, in 2018, inflation was 2%. And more importantly, inflation expectations were very well anchored around 2%. That is not the case today. And you can say whatever you want, but the Fed doesn't have a mandate of pushing up risk assets. There's a dual mandate on inflation and labor market. And today, it basically has one mandate. It is to fight inflation, inflation, and inflation again. So, so that's a fascinating um, comment you made about the, the market. If it continues to function, it, they won't step in. And, and I, I tend to agree with you because I think a lot of people mistake the Fed put as being a put on the equity prices, whereas I would, or I've argued that it's actually a put on credit conditions. Would you agree? Well, let's check together. So if I look at I'm short uh, credit spreads, there is a very simple way that uh, you know people can do that in general. You don't need to have an ISDA or anything like that. There are two very interesting instruments, um, ETFs in America. You can borrow, you can short, you can buy puts on them, whatever you want to do to be short. Th- those are called LQDH and HYGH. So you maybe are familiar with LQD and HYG. Those are the investment grade and high yield bond ETFs, pretty liquid. The H at the end of it means interest rate hedged. So basically, you're trading only the credit spread in that basket of bonds underlying, right? Why don't you take a second and explain to people exactly what's occurring if you buy or sell this product and and talk to us about the difference between interest rate risk and credit risk. Yeah, cool. So um, let's say you buy LQD, all right? So you're basically buying a a bunch of investment-grade bonds that are packed in, a, in an ETF, right? right? And they're weighted according to certain criteria, whatever. So in that case, you are long two things. You are long interest rates, so-called duration in jargon, and you're long credit spreads too, which means basically bond deals can be decomposed. Uh, I have a bond market 101 series on the Macro Compass, by the way, guys. You can find all of that on my free newsletter. But wh- one of the decomposition you can do for bond deals is you can uh, look at interest rate and credit spreads. So interest rate risk is basically the risk that by locking in a certain yield when you buy bonds, actually yields go up in the meantime while you hold the bond. So that's that's a a risk, a cost opportunity risk you're running effectively. And that's the interest rate risk. Credit spreads are effectively the risk of default. Because you're owning uh, uh, bonds or notes of companies as opposed to sovereigns who are generally always good for it. So if you look at the treasury yield, then the only risk you're running is interest rate risk. Right. Right. And then, well, it's a bit more technical, but yes, something that's old. right. But we understand. So the, the, the LQD is is uh, investment grade bonds. And then the HYG yeah. is uh, high, high yield. yield bonds. And the important so, part so, is if you add the H, you're in yeah. essence taking out the interest rate component and you're only getting the credit component. That's correct. So there will be somebody, which is um, iShares, I think, is the owner of the ETF in this case, which will hedge your interest rate risk for you. So if bond deals are interest rate risk plus credit risk, and they hedge the interest rate risk, you're only left with the credit spreads, right? Those represent and measure the credit risk in your basket of underlying bonds. So it's a pretty cool format to be long or short credit spreads without having to trade CDS or all that complicated. Crap. You know, and, and Alf, I, I didn't know about this till I, till you started talking about it. It's, it's, well, it's, it's, it's uh, that alone is, is worth, you know, subscribing to your letter because I had no idea this even existed. This is a well, fantastic product because as you say, usually people have to go create trade is does or, you know, figure out over the counter ways to do this. And now the average Joe can create trade credit spreads. Yes. Well, it's getting much more democratized when it comes to the products you can trade by uh, ETFs. Um, it's it's actually getting very interesting. Uh, but Kevin, if only you knew how much I'm learning from uh, from you. So uh, <laughs> this is one thing I thought you taught me then. So let's talk. <laughs> well, about that's that. very kind now. of you. Okay, so why don't we talk back about the original question was yeah. uh, whether credit spreads are really what drives the Fed or let's say illiquidity right. in credit markets as opposed to the actual... Uh, equity level put. So, okay, so let's go back to this credit spread story, right? So if I look at the series of credit spreads, high yield US credit spreads are now at 460 basis point, which might not mean much for people, but let's go back to 2018. In 2018, the peak of this credit spread was around 480 basis point. And at that point, the Federal Reserve basically effectively walked in. Right? And we had the first verbal intervention, the pivot, et cetera, et cetera. Now, why is that important that we are approaching these levels? Is because 
credit, basically the, the credit spreads define how easy or difficult it is for companies to access the credit market. And corporate debt, private debt to GDP in America, despite everybody talks about public federal debt, the government can print its own money, but the company or, or, or a household, it can't. It needs to refinance its debt and service it with cash flows. That's what the private sector has to do. And there are $35 trillion in private debt in America. I want to repeat the number, $35 trillion. That's round about, I think, 170% of GDP, something like that. It's, it's pretty large. And so when these companies, Kevin, all of a sudden find out they need to refinance, you know, they, they were levered. They maybe had this borrowing binge in 2019, in 2017, in 2021. Spreads were very low. So maybe they borrowed for five years. That's the typical high-yield borrowing um, tenor. And then they, they borrowed, and now these bonds are maturing. And if they want to continue running at, at, at an operating leverage, they need to refinance. And now they're going to go and refinance at credit spreads, which are much higher, and interest rates, which are much higher. So basically, a, a junk company in the US has to refinance at 7% today. Does its business model work at 7%? Well, in most cases, probably it doesn't. And now, so do you expect that as those credit spreads widen, that that also has the effect of slowing down the economy just as the Fed wants? Yes, of course it does. So long, very long answer to your question. Credit spreads are incredibly important. Because if you think about the capital structure, you have treasuries. So it's basically the risk-free rate. Then you have investment grade spreads, junk spreads, and then you have some hybrid instruments, and then you have equities. Right? That's more or less how it works. So you are now going to the very uh, center of the capital structure, which is credit spreads. And it matters because the private sector, the more it's able to lever up in a short period of time, so the more cheap access to credit it has, the higher the probability that growth is going to cyclically be stronger. Simply because companies have access to more cheap funds and they can put it at use in the private sector. Now do the opposite and make these funds either unavailable straight away or extremely expensive, and the private sector will walk into a deleveraging environment. So they will not be able to refinance. They will need to cut some costs to shrink the business model to something that makes sense without leverage, which means they have to cut the workforce. They have to cut CapEx. They have to cut all of that, which then means the, the real economy slows down too. Now, you mentioned the fact that in 2018, the, um, it was the uh, Powell did his pivot. And, you know, he, he was a long way from neutral, and then very quickly became, he was at, he was through neutral before you knew it. Um, he did the pivot at 480 basis points or something like that, and and yet we're now at 420, so we're not actually that far away. Do you expect him to pivot or even show any signs of worry at the previous point that he had pivoted? So. I have the chart in front of me. It was 485 basis point. That was the peak in high yield spreads, five year high yield spreads in America. He then pivoted basically at the beginning of January where they were 470. And since then, we only tightened. Now we are at 460. So we are extremely close. Oh, to that okay. And the answer is no, he's not going to pivot. The, because in 2018, again, he was looking at inflation expectation completely anchored, and he was looking at the market which was breaking down effectively in front of his eyes. The junk bond market, if I remember correctly, was shut down for something like 57 trading days. So <laughs> it's like, you know, companies can't borrow. They just can't access the market at all. They don't even try. And so in that situation, the way of the other side of his mandate, which is financial stability, the labor market growth starts to matter. Because if you put it on a weight scale, you know, inflation is not a problem. It's 2%. Inflation expectations are 2%. So you need to basically bring back things into equilibrium and ease financial conditions to make sure you don't damage the demand side, the labor side of the mandate of the Fed. Forward to today, Kevin, the situation is totally different. We talked about inflation expectation, the distribution, the right fat tail. And obviously, he can't afford to walk in and ease financial conditions. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, so now let's just imagine he's successful, and he's successful more than he thinks. How do you envision it playing out? Like, wh where is the biggest um, kind of bang for your buck if you wanted to trade uh, this continued delevering and a tightening of financial conditions? Okay, so what I did back in December is I looked at the components of the financial condition index. 
and then I looked at what was the tightest um, regressing it in an environment where financial conditions have to tighten. So basically in a, in a volatility adjusted or range adjusted fashion, was it interest rates? Was it credit spreads? Was it the dollar? Was it equities? And back then I found out it was a mix of, at the beginning of the year, real interest rates were extremely low. So then I showed the tips back then. I, of course, made a lot of wrong trades, by the way, guys. Don't assume I'm always right. I'm, I'm, I'm 50% of the times wrong, just for the record. Um, but then as we moved into the financial condition index, credit spreads became a better way to express it. Now, if I look at the, um, at the overall equation, I think that uh, the best risk-reward expression in the US are, uh, is the S&P 500, which I'm short. I'm still short credit spread simply because I let my profits run, Kevin. I mean, it's a very systematic approach and I have a trailing system. We can talk about it later. So I don't think about the trade anymore. But as conviction, if you ask me, that would be the S&P 500. And the reason is that if I look at S&P 500 returns, total returns, those are, well, dividend yield, but well, it's, it's negligible in terms of contribution to total return, earnings growth, and um, changes in multiples, in valuations, right? That drives the S&P returns. And I look at earnings. And well, we're, we're having some wobbles already as we speak. Have a look at Amazon, for example, although some companies also delivered okay. But analyst consensus for earnings growth last week was 11% year-on-year growth for nominal earnings. And if I look at my models, I'm looking actually at anything between zero and minus 3% in earnings this year. And so already from that side, I think you know analysts are too relaxed about how much the, the real economy will slow down. And the Q1 GDP in America yeah, hinted at that already. And the second thing is if I look at valuations, so let's say 12-month forward PE, and I regress them against you know forward real interest rates or any other macro regime that resembles what we are looking today, well, you might argue so far the repricing was pretty benign. So I think there is more to go there. Um one of the things that in terms of some financial conditions, and, and Alf, you beat me to it, actually. I, I wanted to write a whole piece on financial conditions and go through them, but maybe I should just go look at yours. Um, <laughs> the One of the pieces, and in, in, for those who don't know, different um, financial condition indicators have different inputs. They're not all the same, and very there's there's a whole different slew of them. But some of them use the dollar, and some of them use the change in, in the currency. Do you foresee, is that part of the reason that you're also bearish on earnings? That it's difficult yeah. when, with the dollar rising so far, so fast? I mean, yes. A short answer is yes. I think I'm going top of my head, so don't quote me on that. But the companies in the S&P 500 have something like 40% of the earnings abroad. And so obviously, if, if the dollar appreciates, it you know, it, it plays a role there. It becomes more difficult as well for foreign investors to access the market. It's, you know, the dollar plays a role in all of that. And it's going up mostly for two reasons, if you ask me. The first is that real interest rate differentials. So rather than nominal, real interest rate differentials have been moving in favor of the US well, for a while now, especially against the euro or against Japan in terms of trades in, in Japan and in Europe are terrible because they're net energy importers. So that all helps. And the other reason why the dollar is going up, I think, is because global trades are obviously slowing down because of supply chains. And so if you are an emerging market or a, a foreign corporate that has issued dollars or a foreign bank that has issued dollars through the euro dollar system, you all of a sudden have a hard time getting your hands on these cash flows in dollars coming from global trades that you normally use to service these euro dollars liabilities in denominated in dollars, right? Yep. And so... Of course, there's going to be a rush to spot dollars to make sure you can service these liabilities. It's a combination of the two. Yeah, it, it's it's global credit contraction with the with the. Not only that is it not only is it contracting, it's also the cost of it's going up in terms of the as the Fed raises rates. And one of the things that I think is that doesn't this eventually also have to have the effect of shooting the commodities? And that's one of the things I worry about. Although I am a long like I am a commodity bull. And I expect that a couple of years from now, commodities will be significantly higher. I worry that as the Fed tightens and stays here in this stance and as the dollar keeps rising, that it'll eventually cause a hiccup in the commodity markets. Do you have that same worry or you just you don't like commodities in the first place? 
well, I was so wrong on commodities uh, somewhere last year because I was focused on the demand side of the equation and I forgot to look at the supply side the right way. Supply became extremely tight. Demand slowed down and I was right there, much more than consensus, but the supply was so tight that commodity prices, especially spot commodity prices, had to go up. So, Kevin, if you look at um, uh, oil future, copper future, and you look at the first contract, you know, copper has taken a hit, but let's look at oil. Think uh, if I do it right now, so I don't bullshit on the data. If I look at CL1 crude oil, the first contract is $107. And if I look at, uh, let's say, the let's say the 2025, shall we say? Yeah. Three years down the road. The 2025 is $72. Now, obviously, uh, this speaks to, this strong backwardation speaks to demand for a physical commodity and let's say delivery right away, right? So there is a great imbalance there because the supply is extremely tight, as we all know. And then you look a little bit down the road that $72 for a May 2025 oil contract doesn't really speak, uh, you know, for the commodity super cycle. And I get a lot of pushback there because I, I know I hear people telling me, Alf, you don't know shit about commodities, which is probably true. And therefore, the, the, you know, the May 25 oil contract is not liquid and, you know, people are not going to buy that and all of that, right? But, I mean, it's true you need to lock in capital for a while. If you're a hedge fund or a family office, you want to try that, you need to lock up some capital and all of that. But it, it carries and rolls extremely well your way and, you know, you, you, I'm surprised that the commodity super cycle is not at least being priced a bit more down the long end of the of the commodity future curves. It doesn't really look like to me. Do I believe that should be repriced a bit? It's again, it's a demand and supply situation, and the supply, God knows. I mean, Kevin, I have no idea if we're gonna get an, an easier supply or a more difficult supply than priced in already for the next three to five years. I really don't know. I know that the demand of certain commodities has to go up because of ESG, but what people are missing there a bit in the equation is that they look at the amount of copper that is needed to, you know, greenify. Jeez, my English is bad. No, no, I think that's I think that's a I think that's a new word. I think they say that. We make it a word, yeah, yeah. to greenify the economy. And then they look at, you know, what, what's the copper needed today for uh, a combustion engine, or whatever that is, right? Obviously, innovation and technology is not priced in in that equation. So we, we become smarter at making use of less commodities for a single part over time. Mike Green is very vocal on that point too. It's a very long answer to say, look, if I had conviction, then I had the trade on, and I don't have the trade on, Kevin. So I don't have conviction. So you're focused more on the slowing demand side. So you're saying I'm not even going to worry about that because the reality is that I I have other trades on that already express the slowing demand side. Yeah. So um, one of the key things I learned managing money was I'll try and always be the closest you can to the source of your trade, the closest you can, Kevin. In proxy trading, I learned it myself, it's extremely painful because, you know, you start going in second and third and fourth derivatives of your initial thesis. So let's say at the beginning of the year, I was like, you know, real rates have to go up. Okay, cool. So how do I trade this? I'm going to short gold. That would not have worked. Right. That would not have worked. Not the tiny bit. What would have worked is shorting tips. So just some, buy some puts on a tip CTF or whatever. That worked. And the correlation between real rates and gold is extremely high, but for some reason it broke. And we can argue whatever the correlation is or the beta returns of gold adjusted to real rates were not nearly close to what the regression would have shown, right? So I try to get closer to the source, the, well, I don't want to sound too sophisticated, but the the PCA, so the, like the, the first main driver behind the asset return and the performance I expect. Okay. And in this case, it's basically... Uh, slowing demand, faster than consensus, credit getting more expensive. So it's a credit crunch and um, credit getting more expensive and financial conditions tightening. And I have to be as close as I can to the source of the trade, right? And so I decided to express it via shorting the equity market S&P, short LQDH, um, so that's interest rate, uh, sorry, interest rate hedged investment grade corporate spreads. And in Europe, 
Italian government bonds, I think they are um, not going to like what the ECB is going to do here. Okay, so let's, which I was going to bring us to that, and to because that is your third trade, and your idea of being as close to trading it as pure as possible makes a lot of sense to me as someone who's gotten into more trouble than he cares to admit doing second derivative trades of macro trends. Um, why don't you tell us, you know, you are. An Italian, so you know this market very well. You are a fixed income uh, manager, so you know that very well. Why don't you tell us what's driving this trade and why you think there's an opportunity here? Yeah, so um, let's try and make this simple. So the Eurozone is a horrible architecture of a, yeah, whatever, fiscal non-union and a monetary union, right? Okay. So... The ECB is in charge of setting monetary policy for 18 different jurisdictions. Well, everybody has its own neutral rate. Everybody has its own equilibrium and whatever. So good luck with that to start with. Today, we look at the ECB that has had a core inflation print of 3.5% year on year, just printed this morning. And we're looking at inflation expectation for the next five years that are also pointing to a mean outcome of 3.5%. So, Kevin, basically the market is telling that in Europe, things are not going to get easy. It's probably, you know, pricing in supply constraints on commodities going forward. Whatever it's pricing in, it's telling the ECB that they're definitely losing their battle in anchoring inflation expectation at 2%. So, okay, now you're the ECB and until September, October last year, you basically promised never to hike, roundabout. Then things started to change. And then you basically will stop any net QE purchases. So you will not buy any bonds anymore. You will do that in June. And then from July onwards, the bond market is pricing in 75 basis point hikes by the ECB between June and December. That's a lot, like literally, because they can't hike before July. It's materially impossible. They normally do 25 basis point because of forward guidance and whatever other constraints they put on themselves. So basically, the, the market is, is pricing the ECB to hike you know, as much as possible, effectively. Now, what happens is that Italy has to refinance something like 200 billion of maturing liabilities over the next 12 to 15 months. And it finds a situation where the private sector was used to absorb zero out of that. And I want to repeat it, zero, because the ECB was crowding out completely the private sector. It was absorbing all the new supply from Italian government bonds coming to the market and more. So the ECB was looking to bid. It was buying all the new supply and then it was looking to bid Italian government bonds and buy them more from the private sector. So that was basically the situation for years, effectively in a row. And in 2022 and 2023, you're going to find an ECB that simply cannot put the floor under well, a cap under uh, over BTP spreads because it has an inflation problem that it never, never had, basically, over the last 10 years. And so it's a bit the same situation as it is for credit spreads or equities in the US, but it is much less underappreciated. If I look at BTP boon spreads, I opened the trade at 150 basis point. And in situations where there is nervousness in the bond market in, in the Eurozone, because the private sector has to absorb so much in so tight conditions, BTP boon spreads have easily traded at 300 basis point. And then there is a point at which Kevin, like for the Fed before, that might fear that the market breaks down. For Europe, the market breaking down is generally spreads. If peripheral spreads are 400 basis point, 350 basis point, then it becomes a euro existence issue, right? And then they have to decide maybe to do something. But before then, there is a lot to go. So that is a fascinating thought that I had not really kind of considered. And let me just uh, see if I've got it right. The reality is while there is QE happening, because the because the ECB is buying all the bonds, uh, they keep credit spread, or sorry, not credit spreads, country spreads tight because they are absorbing it all. As QE stops, those that that bid in those you know, those country spreads go, the countries goes away and they widen. So in essence, it almost, even though they are sovereign nations, because there is always that kind of existential fear of the EC, EU collapsing, it's not like um, the, the Federal Reserve where the, all the debt's the same. It's actually a situation where people are less likely to buy 
Italian bonds or, or BTPs because they're they're worried about the potential of them eventually leaving at one point. Now, one of the questions I have for you is, is, is it, you said that they can't hike until QE is done. And you said that that was because of uh, the way it, the, uh, like, I can't remember the word you used, but, but, um, is that not that was is, for, is, that, that was forward guidance? Sounds very complicated. No, no, it wasn't that. It was. Am I wrong? Like everyone says that they can't hike until the QE is done, and we use that in the Federal Reserve. But isn't that incorrect? Technically incorrect. Can't they oh, hike yeah, yeah. because of interest yeah. on excess reserves? Like I, I understand in the old regime why they couldn't hike until QE was done. But in this current environment with interest on excess reserves, can't they hike even in the midst of QE? Yes, in theory they can. Right. Uh, so when I said they can't, it's not mechanically impossible. Okay. It is just that they lock themselves in basically with the forward guidance by telling the market a gazillion times that they're first going to stop QE. And it's, by the way, now projected to happen in uh, early Q3, which by the look of things means the 1st of July, <laughs> the, Fed is, uh, the ECB is really going to, use Q3 and the first very day of Q3 to stop QE at this moment. And then, you know, they have a meeting in July. It's a few weeks later. It's a very short window between QE and hikes. But hey, in this situation, you know, uh, with 3.5% core inflation, what are you going to do? The fun part I forgot to mention in this trade is that the Italian economy shrunk by 0.2% in real GDP terms in the first quarter. So, you know, the economy is slowing down. Tax receipts will slow down, obviously, because, you know, Italy is already one of the weak, weakest links when it comes to structural growth in Europe. It is a very, you know, it's very, a very unproductive economic structure and it's a fastly aging economy. And it's access to credit for private citizens. It's completely choked off because banks are full of non-performing loans. There is a terrible regulation in Italy and I'm Italian, so it doesn't, doesn't look like, but I am. And so the private sector is chalked off from credit and the public sector tends to fill the gap by basically borrowing and doing deficits the whole time. That's how it works. And now you're going to make borrowing for the public sector extremely complicated and very expensive. And so what's going to happen is that it's, it's, a, it's a vicious circle where the economy is probably going to slow down even further. So it, I, I, I think this is a pretty skewed trade to either short BTP and buy bonds. And so you, you only look at the spread here between German and Italian government bonds or right away at this point, because of the inflation problems brewing in, in Europe as well, you might just want to short the BTP contract and that's it. Uh, so I think it's fascinating that you agree with me that they technically can actually do QE as they're raising rates, but they've run into the same problem as the, as the uh, Federal Reserve in that they've promised the market that they wouldn't do it. Do you think that that ultimately was a mistake on both of their parts? Because let's face it, that was part of the reason the Federal Reserve chose to be late on their raising of rates because they argued that they were doing they had to wind down the QE and because the QE was set on a schedule, they feel like that they couldn't actually raise rates. But the whole idea of QE is that they actually believe that affects the real economy and I'm probably right in that you and I think that that's not correct, right? Yeah. So uh, this is basically the problem with forward guidance. Forward guidance is very powerful because it informs and drives market expectations and therefore Euribor or Euro dollar contracts. And therefore the Fed and DCB can drive market pricing and ultimately corporate borrowing prices and mortgage rates without even doing anything, just by saying what they're going to do. That's why it's called forward guidance. It's a very powerful instrument from that perspective. There are also downsides, as you just say. Oh, so your, your argument was that they, it's not that they thought that the mechanically they couldn't go and raise rates during the, while they were doing QE. It's that they promised that they wouldn't kind of six months That's ago. Right. So forward guidance, it's all about credibility. Right. If you want it to work in good times, then you can't mess up with it in bad times. I got it. Otherwise, otherwise the market wouldn't, you know, would just, keep on pricing higher risk premium. And it will not just follow what the, the central bank is trying to say at the short end. And so the, the so-called transmission mechanism from monetary policy to the private sector would not work that well. And so now when it ties you to a certain outcome and a certain schedule, you unfortunately have to respect it. Okay, so I, I, so I understand your argument now a little bit better, but doesn't that still, even though 
So, so that explains why they can't do the um, the rate hikes until they get finished off with the QE. But that's still they haven't precluded them doing QE even in the midst of higher rates. So isn't one of the risks to your trades that six months from now, these things blow out and they start doing QE, even though rates are above zero? Uh, yes, that is actually a risk, but I'm going to say that for that to happen, things have to get worse before they get Fair enough. Up. I completely understand. But, but ultimately that will be how they fix it. And I yeah. guess the market would have to... Ec- up until now, people have only done QE when they've been uh, uh, kind of constrained by the zero bound. And that was the only time they did QE. So this would be a dramatic change in policy that people wouldn't be expecting. Pretty much. And also don't forget that there are elections in Italy in uh, exactly one year from now, which might seem a long time. But in October in Italy, generally, we end over the budget for next year and once the budget is ended over then the pm generally resigns and so we walk through elections with a bridge government of sorts and the pm is draghi and draghi is giving a great stability to the country so far and when he quits uh, it's <laughs> it's going to be a disaster as well so there is also that other risk which is a bit down the road and to be honest the trade carries and rolls like a dog we used to say in fixed income so <laughs> it's it's a four basis point a month in my face so I, I'd rather be uh, right quicker than in six months because by the look of things, in six months, I'm already 24 basis points down the drain. And so the, the spread move or the yield move needs to make up for that and more effectively for me to make money. But it is another risk um, but, uh, for BTP. Spreads. Yeah, no, I, but I understand. It, they won't... They won't take such a dramatic or drastic a, a kind of response until we actually get a dramatic move in the prices. Okay, keeping on with the uh, kind of uh, plumbing nerd questions here, I got one for you. You wrote on the 25th, you said the Treasury General account jumped quite a bit as tax receipts were stronger than expected, probably due to capital gains taxes. I completely agree there. Then you said this should imply less T-bill issuance near term which in turn means the RPP war chest can't serve as a release valve to sterilize QT yet. I'd love for you to explain to our listeners what you meant by that. Okay. So um, people are obsessed with the Fed balance sheet, right? They, they, they plot these lines of the Fed balance sheet against the NASDAQ and they're like, okay, look how correlated it is and da 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 da. Right? So the Fed balance sheet effectively without too much technicalities, on the liability side, is all about reserves, bank reserves, right? They can create them, they can destroy them with a keystroke. The fun part is that this is not enough if you want to assess the interbank liquidity going on at any point in time. Because together with reserves, you have also to look at the Treasury General account, and in this case as well, at the reverse repo facility. So, it sounds very complicated, but what happened is that the government effectively got a lot of fiscal receipts in, in April this year, much more than seasonality would already imply because it's tax seasons in the US. So their Treasury General account went up by a mile. That means that the Treasury, in general, if it wants to refund their activities over the next six months, Kevin, they can simply draw down the Treasury General account rather than issuing bonds if they choose to. Right. So far, so good, yep. right? So if they decide to do that and they don't issue bonds or bills or whatever it is, I talked about bills to make a connection with the reverse repo uh, facility, and I'm going to talk about why. Let's say that they go that path and they draw down the Treasury General account and that's how they fund themselves rather than issuing bonds. Right. Okay. So in that case, they will not be going to be issuing bonds. And the money that is stuck on the reserve repo facility This is basically money market funds looking for a way to park their overnight excess bank deposits to a place that is safer than a deposit at JP Morgan. So they don't want to run credit risk, basically, on on a commercial bank. They have now a great um, tool to park it back at the Federal Reserve via the Reserve Repo Facility. And people were basically telling me, and they're right, that this Reserve Repo Facility would be a war chest to absorb the quantitative tightening drawdown in reserves. Because how it would work is that it's true that the Federal Reserve buys less with QT, right? So they don't roll over their holding of bonds or bills that mature. 
But if the government would issue, you know, rather short-term instruments, then the money which is parked on this reserve repo facility could actually absorb that new net issuance. That's right. They could act as a war chest. They could change, now, they could change Federal Reserve or reverse repo for T-bills, in essence. That is correct. Okay. That is correct. And so the Treasury had to change their issuance strategy in the first place to make this work and issue many more bills, right, to attract the money from the reverse repo facility. Okay. And now, now they have a lot of cash at hand because of the Treasury General account has gone up. Right? So they're, they're really not incentivized to issue short-term instruments again. I mean, if you want to follow an issuance strategy, they will going to be issuing, I don't know, five or seven and 10 and 30-year bonds as they normally do, which is a part of the curve that the money stuck at the reserve repo facility cannot buy. Right? They can much more, in a much more difficult way, absorb that part. And therefore, it's up to the private sector. And so that is important to see how the Treasury will look at their issuance strategy against drawing down their TGA and how this is going to interact with the reverse the money stuck in the reverse repo facility. Now, do you think that there's a chance that the Treasury is not as aware of this as they should be and that we will, in essence, have kind of uh, a mismatch of duration? meaning all sorts of assets that want to buy the short end, the front end of the curve in, in riskless assets, and yet the Treasury will be busy issuing longer dated stuff, and that will cause uh, a widening of the curve eventually? Well, the interesting thing is, Kevin, that one other way to make financial conditions tighter is to make long end real interest rates higher. And so... Potentially, how can you do that if you want to compound the problem is by issuing a lot of long-term bonds. Well, even not a lot, but just a decent amount. And not basically allowing or engineering for the reverse repo facility funds to be able to buy those. And so what happens there is that the private sector has to step in effectively because the Fed isn't stepping in anymore to absorb these issuance. And if you tell you know, a trader like I was or you know, market maker or whatever, you tell him, Alf, uh, you know, expect that from now to the next six months, you're going to have to absorb much more third-year treasuries on your balance sheet. And people are like, yeah, you know, but it's a couple of billions. It's fine. No, guys. A couple of billions of third-year treasuries for a guy who has a mark-to-market book are as big as, let me think, 12 billion of five-year bonds. Right. Because the... The long bond moves more with interest rates and therefore it's more volatile. Well, indeed. I mean, yeah. if I have two billion of five year bonds, my risk manager might, you know, be scared. If I have two billion of third year bonds, my risk manager is already tapping my shoulder <laughs> straight away. Right. Right. I mean, of course. So obviously what that does, the first round effect of that is to make traders make room for that, which means they will demand a higher yield higher real yield at the long end. And don't forget what we said before, Kevin, if real, real yields are the very first uh, building block of the capital structure pyramid, if you make risk-free real interest rate higher, you make things more complicated for everybody on the capital structure, investment grade companies, high yield companies, and, and uh, equity issues anyway. So uh, I don't think, again, the Fed is willingly going to go there, but it is something to watch. You don't get you. You think that they? Well, first of all, isn't it not the Fed's decision, and isn't it actually the Treasury's decision? You're right. You're. I'm yeah. sorry. You're and right. and uh, and then that that implies that they're actually working together and that they know what they're doing. And I think that that's a big. Both of those are probably <laughs> bigger. Well, I mean, in such a delicate macro environment, I would hope that they talk to each other. I mean, people are very scared about you know uh, the Fed and the and the Treasury working closely. Ultimately, they are the Fed is an arm of the government. Yeah, ultimately. So I agree with you there. But Alf, when I saw how much they ran up the TGA during the COVID crisis, it, yeah. it to me it, it defied all logic. And and I don't think that the neither the Fed nor the Treasury understood the effects that they were having on the economy and markets with the with that account. Yeah, I mean <laughs> that was huge. I have to be honest. And there was a part as well of the growth tailwinds that we have seen in, 20, in late 2020, let's say in the first half of 2021 as well, because most of the fiscal stimulus was done in um, basically 2020 in uh, 
H2 2020, so between April and uh, December 2020, that was the largest part. But because of this Treasury General account drawdown dynamics and accumulation, it also somehow got um, with a growth tailwind all the way into mid of 2021. Oh, and I think it also was a, a big factor in the speculation in the stock market. And I know I, I, I just committed hearsay with, uh, by saying that to a lot of people who think they're not affected. But I, I, I am a big believer that those sorts of things aren't as understood as well as we think and that that liquidity getting dumped out into the economy was part of the reason for those stocks moves. And, and, and Kevin, you and I are very vocal on the fact that the, the money printer here is the government and not the Federal Reserve from, from this side. I mean, the government is able to boost the size of your uh, bank account. They literally can do that. They can make your bank account larger, and they did in 2021, big times. Right. So basically, they make a hole in their balance sheet because they can, because they issue currency, and they make your balance sheet all of a sudden being higher in terms of net worth. And that's what they did. So obviously, if you if you <laughs> do that and the private sector bank accounts become bigger and everybody's stuck at home, yeah, I mean, you, you want to have to argue that some of this will go into speculative assets. Yeah. So, Alf, it's getting late and it's uh, you want to go out on a Friday night and you've been kind enough to, to stick with us this long. So I'm going to wrap up with my five questions that I love. Let's start with the first one, which is um, your favorite investment book. Ooh, can I name? Two? Yeah, you can name as many as you like. Thank you. So, um, Pragmatic Capitalism, Cullen Roche. Oh, great. Cullen. He's a great guy. Yeah. Cullen explains extremely well in an intuitive way how uh, there are different tiers of moneyness. Bank reserve is a type of money. T-bills are another type of money. Ten-year bonds are another type of money, and et cetera, et cetera. And bank deposits are most of the money we use. And it is an eye-opener. A very short book, by the way, it's like 150, 200 pages, and extremely well explained. It will open your eyes on how the monetary system works. And it's not what you think. No, the Fed doesn't print money you can use. Okay. So it's good that Cullen Roche uh, explains that. Great guy. The second book is from uh, Professor Steve Keen. And uh, you can read a couple of, the, uh, of him, of his books. Uh, the latest one is very good. It's called um, A Manifesto of New Economics. Okay. <laughs> And so basically, Professor King is extremely vocal in making the difference between private debt and public debt. So he will then move on to explain why private credit creation is different than public deficits and why this difference matters. And it's also very important to understand, to grasp the economic cycle. And then third, um, it's always a close one, but I'm going to say Richard Koo, the holy grail of macroeconomics or balance sheet recession. Uh, so those basically balance sheet recession, recession talks about Japan, which has been there already with credit creation and negative real interest rates and da, 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 da. Uh, and they've been there doing that for 25, 30 years. And Richard explains very well what happens when that model breaks, which is, by the way, where probably we're going uh, in developed economies as well with some differences, but it's a very informative book. And the holy grail of macroeconomics is just... Uh, very good macro book in general. You know, you're the first person to mention Richard Kuh, and I've always been a big fan. And, and like you, that was one of them that opened my eyes. But uh, I will I will push back a little on Richard Koo and say that he's still stuck in the old idea that reserves get lent out. I know, yeah. I know. But, he, but it, uh, listen, but it's, he, what he says up until that point is very important in understanding that. And then eventually you can realize and go to the next levels and you can you can see where he, where his logic might break down. So these, these books are complementary somehow. So, you know, um, Keen and Roche will explain to you that that is not the case. Banks don't lend reserves. Yeah. But uh, Richard will explain to you what happened in Japan. So I think it's... it's yeah. uh, but those are great choices. I love those. Those are those are terrific oh. and very much outside the box. And, and I didn't realize that Cullen had a book. I'm, as soon as we get off here, I'm going to go buy it. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, next question. Are great traders and investors born or made, Alf? Oh, my God. Um, they're made. They are made because in order to be a great trader or a great investor, you need to master your own uh, animal spirits and psychology. So you need to be able to admit to yourself that you will be wrong. 
You need to look for your edge and build a systematic approach to size your position according to the volatility of the underlying class uh, asset class, stop out when you need to be stopped out and let your profits run. I mean, it's really as, almost as simple as this, um, which means that with a lot of work, traders can be made. That's, that's, I like that answer as well. Okay, let's move on to the two fun ones. And and uh, and I hope you have some ideas for us. The first one is the Byron Wien. Byron Wien was a, uh, is a strategist that always talks about his surprises for the next year and how he defines a surprise. is something the market expects a less than one-third chance of occurring, but he assigns a greater than 50-50 chance of it happening. Do you have a Byron Wien surprise for the next year for us? Um, stronger disinflationary forces than you can expect, which means that I'm being very patient with uh, buying bonds. I haven't bought any, basically. But if the process of credit crunch goes too long uh, and becomes too harsh, Kevin, then the ripple effects on the demand side are so bad, then a disinflationary wave might be there. So I think that that is definitely not priced in. If you look at forwards, like you know, the, over the next eighteen months, terminal rate in the US is priced to be at three percent. So if I am right, you know, buy some call spreads on euro dollar or something like that. You have payouts that are one to ten. If uh, LIBOR ends up being one and a half percent in twenty twenty three, for example, in essence, that the economy rolls over more quickly than we think. Yes, either that or risk assets break down so bad that ultimately, you know, the Federal Reserve needs to come in. Uh, I think, again, it is not my best case. So you asked for something yeah, yeah, that no, is a low yeah, Something that's yeah. mispriced in terms of the, uh, the probability of it occurring. Yeah, so I had Mike uh, Green on my podcast, and I'm not going to say what the trade is because you have to listen to it. It's called <laughs> the market trading floor. Uh, it's on Sunday. Mike's a great guy. And he talked about something like that uh, and he made a case for it. Uh, but yeah, I, th I think the risk reward in some of these 2023, 2024 euro dollar futures, also if I look at implied volatility, Kevin, I mean, seriously, the front, like June 2023 euro dollar contract, if you look at straddles um, for implied volatility, you have something like. Uh, 150 basis point of implied it's volatility. it is mean? nuts how it, it's as in essence as wide as it's ever been in the euro dollar market yeah imagine kevin you walk to somebody it's like okay so give me your uh your break-even ranges for a straddle on euro dollar and he goes like plus 100 plus 350 yeah <laughs> it's, it, it, it's like, it is absolutely nuts. people a lot of uh folks don't look at that front end of the curve because it's a very specialized environment they usually just the the kind of domain of fixed income traders and and specialized hedge funds but they should really go have a look at it because there are huge opportunities there because of the fact that there is so much volatility and so much worry about what's going to happen to that all right alf uh the final question for you if you were giving advice to a young person that's interested in our business and wanted to get into you know either portfolio management trading or something of that nature what would you tell them? So I would tell them three things. The first is, uh, don't do this job. No, I'm kidding. The first is, uh, uh, be curious. The only way to be successful and enjoy this lifestyle is to be curious. It's a never ending learning journey. It's, it's ridiculous. How many things you have to learn. And if you're not passionate about it, then Try to be passionate, and if you're not, then maybe this is not the, the right place for you. Curiosity is, is, a, is a so much underappreciated skill in portfolio management macro in general. The second one is pay attention to your communication skills. So when I went, uh, my career, I was lucky, it went relatively fast. One of my biggest asset classes, or well, one of my biggest um, pros, was that my mentor was extremely good at communication skills. And so I had to learn it. I had to understand I cannot speak um, to everybody in the same way. I need to tailor my message. It is so important because you might think this is all about finding the next trade, risk rewards. And yes, a lot of it is about that, but you will need stakeholder management too. You will need to explain to your risk manager why this time you're taking this position. 
And if you have communication skills, this will help you so much. And a lot of traders out there, I see they're so smart, but they cannot get their ideas out of their brain, literally, <laughs> in an understandable way, because they, they never worked on this skill. I think it, it is so important. I, I, I would say, Alf, that there's some great, uh, quote unquote, great hedge fund managers that out there that are better at communication skills than their actual trading. That is true. That is that. It's like me. It's like me. <laughs> no, uh, you, you, you have them both, and and you're very humble and very uh, kind. And and one of the things I, while you were saying that, stay curious. I think about I. We had this family doctor who was actually our ped, pediatrician, and uh, he was um, he just retired, and I remember kind of very distinctly watching him even into his sixties. He was still going to conferences. He was still learning. And you think to yourself, you know, here you are at the, you know, the end of your career, and yet you're still going and learning. And I feel like that is so important. And even me, you know, I'm an older guy than you, and I, I feel like I learn things all the time. And it is so important to stay curious because the world's always changing. We're always getting better at things. And, and I think that was great advice. So, Alf, I'm going to give you a chance here to tell people about your terrific podcast and your even better newsletter and uh, where they can find more about you. Very kind. So guys, I write a newsletter. It's called the Macro Compass. Uh, for some reason, um, something like 42,000 people are reading that. It's on Substack. It's free. There is no paywall. So the idea is to you know try and pass across these pieces of macro insights, some financial education, if I know a thing here and there, and some investment ideas as well. It's published every week. Uh, the macrocompass.substack.com if you want to find that. And the um, other thing is that recently I launched a podcast. So I'm uh, in the footsteps of Kevin here. And the podcast is co-hosted with my good friend, Andreas Steno Larsen. You should follow him, by the way, if you don't on Twitter. And the idea of the podcast, which is called The Macro Trading Floor, is that we are going to basically invite good macro thinkers, strategies, risk takers, hedge fund managers, all these guys they're going to come on the show. They're going to talk about their macro thesis for 20, 25 minutes. And then we're going to put them on the spotlight. We're going to literally ask them, what is the trade? And they're going to have to stick their neck out, tell us the trade with an horizon of, you know, six months, nine months. So it's, it's an investment, not a trade idea, basically. And they're going to tell us how to implement it as well. So it needs to be something replicable and doable for our listeners as well. And then Andreas and I will debate the pros and cons and the risk reward and all of that. So we aim to be as applicable and practical as we can. That's fascinating. Well, uh, Alf, I'll let you get off. Oh, wait, no, we can't. We, you know, I have one more thing we have to talk about. Uh, sure. As an Italian that, that enjoys his food, I've seen you um, talk about pizza a lot. And I think you have True. a bone to pick with us Canadians about yes. our pizza. And for those who don't know, Pineapple on pizza is not an American thing. It was actually uh, created from a, a, a Greek immigrant that came to Canada, and the Americans have taken this over. But you, uh, you find this abhorrent. I think, Kevin, <laughs> we are not friends anymore, <laughs> and uh, you are not allowed to publish this podcast. <laughs> Just kidding. Everybody can eat whatever they want. But, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm proud Southern Italian and pizza is that thing that you do with sourdough with a 48 hours levitation. There is mozzarella and there is tomato sauce and basilicum on it and a few more stuff, but definitely not <laughs> pineapple. Sorry, guys. I mean, my, my grandma, if my grandmother sees something like that, she's going to have a heart attack. You guys are criminals. You're criminals. <laughs> on the trading desk, the, uh, you know, even though pineapple has gained in popularity when I, when I was in the nineties on the trading desk, the rule was always no fish, no fruit. And otherwise you were allowed to put whatever you want on it. And I thought that was probably a good thing to live by, but I kind of like the, the fruit on the pineapple with on the pizza. I, I think it's good. Uh, Lena, uh, why don't you just quickly get on here? What do you think about the pineapple on the pizza? Um, I'm, I, I used to love it, but um, that's when I was a kid, when my parents... <laughs> then you turned 14 yeah. and you grew up? <laughs> that's right. Lena, Lena is a convert. Well done, Lena. Please educate this savage guy who's <laughs> coming here. I mean, seriously, it's it's like... 
I mean, you, you had to stress out on the trading floor, Lina. They had to make sure to tell you no fruit on the pizza. Who's that barbarian <laughs> putting fruit on the pizza? I mean, geez. fruit is so for that. dessert. I agree. I agree. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Alf. Uh, I look forward. Listen, if you're ever in Canada, you make sure you look us up. We'll take you out for a beer and we'll see if we can convert you with the fruit on the pizza. And I'll make sure if I'm ever in Italy, you can take me and show me how pizza should be done properly. I'm pretty sure that it's not going to be one beer. If That's right. Know. You're absolutely right there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Have a great weekend. Ciao. It's been a pleasure. All right, Patrick, time for talking charts. Lots to talk about, I guess. Holy cow. What a week, eh? All right, so let's uh, let's dive into what we were watching last week and just kind of punch through those things. Uh, obviously, we were watching resource stocks. And, well, let's kind of – the way I would actually put it is, like, it was really not that big movement this week. For all the craziest things that's been happening this week, resource stocks kind of calmed down a little bit. They went up a little bit, a little down. As energy stocks were up a little bit more than the others. and But it wasn't a crazy move this week, uh, on resource names i was thinking that they could bounce but under this market environment everything's being liquidated right yeah it, it really was a boring one i do have uh my new favorite resource stock that the etf which is pick oh really yeah this is my new one i i can't remember where i learned it but um it's it's my new favorite one it's it's the global miners p-i-c-k you want to pull up that chart yeah yeah for sure and uh uh and so what makes it your favorite does that have a good it, options it, chain, by the way? It, well, it's just that it's got a lot of global big miners, a lot of different things, BHP, Rio Tinto, Valley, Free, Freeport, Glencore, Anglo-American, Newcore. Glen, I don't know. It just seems like if you're looking Everything for- Everything you want to own. Yeah. It just, <laughs> it just feels like one of those ones that- uh, So this, I don't know. I put it up on my screen. It's the one I'm watching. It had a big uh, couple of down days, and it subsequently bounced, but- you know, yeah. all, all that it's really done is filled the, that one third gap that uh, about, uh, I guess, on Monday that it gapped down and it filled it on. Now it looks like it might even be headed lower. OK, what yeah. was the number two thing you were uh, watching? Uh, we were we were obviously talking about the uh, rotation and uh, in the equity markets. But what's interesting is uh, this selling is a little broader, like um, uh, but up until uh, this point, we've seen. Um, uh, the the defensives more or less taking a lot of inflow and actually working and uh, obviously those uh high beta and tech techish names were all selling but uh in the last few days uh we saw everything get hit they're actual we're we're reaching a point where like you know like here's a the for instance the XLP had a, a, a solid down day today. XLU, uh, so a, a week of uh, profit taking as this thing uh, is all, well almost 10% off of its highs in just a week. The point being here, uh, actually, I didn't look at the XLV. Yeah, XLVs like the, uh, the healthcare is taking it. Right now, the selling is now uh, pretty uh, much right across the board. It's like a discrepancy. You know what's interesting is as well is that even last week, we had a situation where sentiment was already washed out, but yet it just it's continuing lower and the selling is just accelerating, even though it seems like the amount of bulls out there are already at uh, session lows. Well, I want to talk more about that once we get to the normal talking chart. So let's just move on. And the last thing we were just touching on was Japan. Um, everything from uh, BOJ to the uh, yen to, um, uh, to like the whole thing. The, uh, the obviously yield curve control is something that they're pretty hell bent on, right? They're 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 showing no <laughs> signs of uh, of blinking. And we had a, a big move up when they doubled down or tripled down on the yield. Yeah, curve Yeah, look control. at the way that U.S. dollar yen just another. Uh, every time, uptick. every time he opens his mouth, it just a Corrado. It just another. It's just another excuse to sell yen. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a trend that's just been uh, in full motion, and it's been truly feeding that dollar rally uh, that's been going. But uh, what's interesting is obviously, as uh, and quietly, uh, the Nikkei is uh, is holding up because obviously, as as the currency weakens, it's a, it creates some buoyancy in the equities over there, and in a 
yeah, down day that was uh, pretty ugly in most global equities. The Nikkei seems to at least initially be holding up. Obviously, it was it already by the time this bloodbath happened in the afternoon, the Nikkei was already closed for the weekend. Uh, so we'll see how it opens on Monday. But that's or, what happens when you're stealing growth from the rest of the world by oh, yeah. appreciating well, your that's, current. That's that's exactly that's uh, beggar thy neighbor stuff that's happening uh, over there. But you know what? The Nikkei may very well uh, continue to be more buoyant. I don't want to say it's going to out perform on the upside but uh, you know uh, if you're on a hedged basis owning the nikkei it might be a place to hide in in this carnage right uh, i completely agree i would argue even with the yen all the way down here that it might be a place to hide regardless even not even not uh, yeah. currency hedge okay all right so, let's so talk number about what the- are we watching for next week Swing high in the U.S. dollar was that uh, was that enough? You know what? Uh, obviously, we, we just saw a ridiculous melt up this week on that dollar index. Like, look at the fla- the five uh, trading sessions up till or four trading sessions up till today's little reversal. Like, just uh, it, it went parabolic. Like, it accelerated the rate from which it was just a, a U.S. dollar melt up as ever, uh, all the cross currencies just got their faces ripped off. And the thing is, is that when we go onto a weekly or even monthly chart, we've now approached uh, the highs, decade highs, right? Like the, back in 2016, 17, we saw those highs up along where we're trading right now. And um, obviously a little bit of a reversal day. And all I want to watch next week is that – is the price at least going to stall here? I think it is way too premature to be looking for a U.S. dollar top and some major reversal trend. But uh, typically when you hit a major overhead resistance, it usually temporarily stalls out that price and um, and creates some consolidation, which could be even weeks of just grinding and backfilling this move. And when you look at it from, uh, forget the Dixie, but look at it from a Euro perspective, that Euro has now hit down those 2017 lows near that 105. I, I still have uh, nightmares of these levels because I lost a steak dinner to you and Cuppy betting off of these lower levels of the yen uh, so the euro last time but um the thing is is that uh, this is a very logical place for there to be at least the price stopping and taking a break. Forget about calling it a, re- a bottom and a reversal of euro. But uh, will we get some sort of a bounce? I'm watching that. Do you have any uh, thing that's Well, on I your guess mind? one of the things is that it, it's, it's in danger of uh, – if it does – top out here the u.s dollar it's in danger of uh invalidating one of my tenants of uh technical analysis today the triple uh tops. there is no such thing as a triple top. no but you know what i actually though don't think that uh what the point i'm trying to make here is, is that, that it could, necess- yeah it doesn't happen to happen tomorrow it could stall exactly. here for a month and then break take out even and- more it could stall here for two three months it's a big picture yeah. uh, multi five year trend it, uh, you know this doesn't all happen in a few days so um, I'll, I'll tell you one thing kind of a little piece of anecdotal uh, uh, kind of uh, tidbit that I'll give you Thursday morning when the dollar was screaming and everything was going and then all of a sudden we got the GDP numbers that were really weak. One of my pals that uh, I'm lucky enough to chat with that's, uh, you know, one of the big, big monster hedge fund traders out there who I think is one of the most smartest guys out there. He DM'd me and he says, I think the top's in for the dollar. And it's unusual because he's really more of a stock fellow. And he was pretty sure that the dollar was top, it was uh, was topping out. And then one of the guys that I trade with that, again, is more of a stock guy but watches the currencies because he's a big gold trader, he also kind of whispered something to us uh, to the same degree. He says, I think this is it for the dollar. So it feels to me like those uh, really kind of cagey trading type guys, they are sensing that that dollar move is wow. extended and almost t- done. And that would you know, le- lend credence to your idea that uh, this I, move I is going to pause. I suspect that uh, they may be big picture trading members because on <laughs> Wednesday when I blew out all of our long U.S. dollar positions, they, the, the word must be spreading, right? No. That's right. <laughs> this billion-dollar hedge fund manager. <laughs> I, uh, uh, you know what? I really think of that. Was really, that was really small of him not to say he got the idea from you, Patrick. <laughs> Number two, what do we got? <laughs> <laughs> the FOMC. Um, well, we're going to get a, a tidbit from uh, the Fed. Oh, gosh. Can you like think about how volatile it's been now and then throw in the Fed to top it off? 
I don't. Well, you know, know what, what though? I, it, what would be interesting is what if the market, like, let's go through a, one scenario. We'll talk about it in a second. But what if the stock market just goes slamming lower, just day after day after day, early Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, just bam, 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 and they and the market's doing it to see if they can make Powell blink. And and oh, uh, that's and, interesting. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and basically see whether or not uh, they they get a, a Powell throws them a bone and tries to calm the market down. Like, could we? It would be interesting to see whether or not they're sending a message to FOMC and and whether the, this all kind of comes together that way. Uh, you know, it could, but I would say that even if the stock market, it would have to be a 1987 style crash for them to change anything. They're well, not, not change. Changing. No, 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 not no, no. Even, language not, just not even language. I'm telling yeah. you, I think the language and the next two moves are completely priced in. I've said this for a while. We're having two fifties and then we're going to look from there. Yeah. Okay. So nothing right, well, is happening. So I would say that unless wow. the stock market is down 25% before Wednesday, it, the fed is doing what the fed is doing. I don't, I am in no way saying that they're not doing what they're going to do. No, you're I'm just saying that they might air on. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, they just kind of give, throw the market a bone with a little, like where we understand shit's happening. We're going to, we're watching, you know, yeah. like just, I, I think uh, we're a ways away. So you're in essence saying they're just, I'm not predicting that. I'm just no, saying, know, I'm asking it. Yeah. And you're saying that you're kind of speculating whether they yeah. would remind the market about the fed put. And I would say that they don't want to remind the market about the Fed put. And unless it would have to be so ugly for them to do it. So I wow. think no matter what. Now, that doesn't mean the market's not going to have already sold it down there on its own. And it yeah. could be a situation that it, they, the market is so concerned about it that it's a buy the, buy the you know, sell the room. Buy the, the dip news. It, it, could, it could definitely be a, uh, yeah, selling, and they, selling and they the rumor. Interp- and, and they then might interpret the, it as bullish or dovish, let's say. Because they had talked themselves into the fact that, oh, maybe the Fed's going to do 75. Yeah. And so, therefore, it, it does end up being a buy the news kind of event. But all I know is, Patrick, is the volatility is going up. And the fact that the Fed is thrown into the mix sure makes going to make for an interesting week next week. Yeah. All right. So, obviously, number one, we have to say is, like, uh, what's next for these markets? I mean, uh, now... Uh, one thing that I've been telling my big picture trading members over and over again is that once you're up at the 30 level, uh, 30 handle on the VIX, that these 100 S&P point swings on an intraday uh, basis is just what happens. This is like that the day in, day out volatility is normal. And uh, and so, you know, obviously well, on Thursday when we had that rip higher and it was up 100 S&P points and um, it's like, oh, there was there a bottom? But, you you know, I was uh, cautioning and saying like, you know what? Well, like, yeah, one day is a nice update, but do the bulls follow through? You know, I would, I'd lo- uh, in order for this uh, trend to have changed, you know, they would have had to work it up towards 4,400 and really show some follow through buying. We had a, a one update and they hammered it today, right back down to the lows, going into the weekend trading right along a major low. Like it just, it, it's, um, we're at the edge of a cliff. And does the market lose its footing over the weekend? Well, that's uh, a good line. It's almost like you said that before, Patrick. Uh, I, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I'll tell you, all the rallies are failing. And uh, and it's very hard for like what do people lean on to buy the dip? This, I I think that there's genuine fear in the market here, and uh, and like usually someone big has to come in and start buying with authority to really change a trend. And uh, you know what? With with the oversold conditions that we had, this should have been already a short term low, and uh, and there's no sign of it. The the market is more vulnerable than not that uh, we have a downside going. The thing is. When you step back and look at this on a weekly chart, and I kind of like look at it and say, all right, so we had uh, an S&P 500 that from the COVID lows had a a 2,600 point rally, 122% in uh, in a span of, let's just say two years, just for rounding purposes, right? Uh, Just an extraordinary rally. Even giving back 50% of that, is a 1300 point S&P drop from top to bottom which would bring us to about 3500. 
Which would be right? the top of the range and it would make a uh, lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. It would. And the thing is, is that it just feels like 3,500 is so far away. Uh, and, and yet, like, if we give out these lows, there is no way you can draw any support lines technically on this thing. Like, you're in no man's land. There's like an air pocket uh, down to the next major kind of support levels. Um, it, I'm not, uh, you know, there's obviously no certainties. And we can't guarantee that a market can is going to do something. But it is very vulnerable. And if, uh, if it loses its footing off that edge of the cliff, there's a pretty good uh, air pocket below where we could have a couple of those uh, 200 S&P point down days back to back and just really kind of uh, really uh, puke out this market on the downside. Uh, well, it's uh, boy, is it going to be an interesting one next week? Okay. From your lips to God's yeah. ears. All right. Let's, uh, let's talk some charts uh, beyond the S and P uh, let's, let's actually just talk about some of those stocks that came out with their earnings. Uh, I'm just going to start with just the Fang futures, which uh, seem to be very weak, but um, you know, breaking to lower lows and turning, but we had uh, uh, Apple, come out, uh, initially tried to positively react on its earnings, gave it all back, right back down to the low. But did you see what happened to Amazon? Like, yeah. no such thing as a triple bottom. That's uh, <laughs> There you go again. And you know, that's the chart that, I, that I've that i been pointing out over and over again. Started with AMD, NVIDIA, Microsoft. Google, like all Google, of them. And, it, and, and it, none it of them helped. All did the same. And, the, and, and, and none, none of them, them helped. Help. Yeah. None of them helped. And you know, and, uh, Jeff, uh, he retired like right at the top. That guy's the beans, man. Like, when yeah. did he retire? Like, what was the date? And then, and then, what's his face? Mackenzie, his daughter, do- his uh, his wife, she sold all a good chunk of it at the top as well. well he doesn't even need what? to buy Twitter to come up with a reason for that. There you go. <sighs> All right. Anyway, but uh, like a crazy movement. Like, let's talk about some of the other ones. Google just keeps bleeding on the downside. Microsoft, um, you know, it, actually, Microsoft hasn't broken. Oh yeah, and, that's uh, the one. not not really. But the, it'll be really interesting to see if um, if uh, this uh, finally succumbs to the selling and breaks on the downside. Uh, but uh, you know, it's interesting is. Facebook, obviously, uh, after being ridiculously oversold for almost three months of systematic selling, uh, got a positive reaction. But one of the interesting things that I want to technically watch, so, so far, that little gap higher on earnings has done nothing but, you know, retrace half of the um, April drop. And uh, while, uh, you know, breakaway gaps like that sometimes can actually mark bullish turning points, one of the things that is really important is not the gap itself, but what it does in the next three, four trading sessions. And one of the things that I think would be um, horrible for this chart would be it to fade all the way to 180 or lower on the downside in the next uh, uh, the next three trading sessions uh, starting next week. Because it, when you have a bullish gap, that kind of is an advertisement for a technical traders to start buying and no one buys, it's like you might as well put the nails in the coffin. That just like is an advertisement that this thing has not done its distribution cycle and that's uh, another full leg lower is coming. Uh, it's, I'm not making that prediction, but I'm just saying the next three days are going to be really important. I, I, for some reason, when you said that, Patrick, I could just picture you with like a bunch of nails in your mouth and then one by one putting you know, in the coffin. Putting in the coffin. <laughs> With a beer, a with beer a beer in my hand, and a nail in the coffin shut. That's Patrick. But, like Netflix has not been able to even put up a decent update. Like this is just some big fund managers that have been holding this thing are just unloading this shit. There's some sort of, uh, you know, they're they were overweight and they got maybe it's Ackman. <laughs> no, he sold it all. He's gone. Oh yeah. Oh, is he gone? Yeah, he actually in he, and then out. He did he did the opposite of Kathy Wood. Kathy Wood is doubling down on her tell docs and uh Ackman got a bad earnings result and he just took his loss and drove on. Yeah, that, that's and a that's smart boy. listen, that is a smart guy because uh you can say what you want about him, but he knows how to survive. And then that you know, is it's like listen, you so you can't get them all right. And the key is is that when you're wrong, you have to admit that you're wrong and you have to you have to go to cash. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, and reassess, get yourself credit. flat and you know, I always tell that story about George Soros when he was having trouble, he would uh, fax because this is how long ago he would fax Goldman Sachs his entire portfolio 
and say, give me a bid on it. And they would bid for all of it and even the shorts and everything. And he'd go 100% to cash. And then Monday, he would recreate his portfolio. That it's sometimes you just need that emotional reset, right? Yep. Anyway, uh, let's talk about uh, the asset sh- that shall not be named. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, uh, when we look at Bitcoin, uh, it's being distributed. Like every rally is failing. Uh, and you know what? I know that there's all these crypto guys out there. But the one crazy part about uh, uh, cryptocurrencies is that they need momentum. They need momentum. And when they don't have momentum, what, do you, what can you anchor off of? Uh, and uh, and the thing is, is that Bitcoin has lost all of its momentum. There is no denying this, and that actually makes it uh, very vulnerable here. It's at a pretty important uh, baseline here. But if just like the triple bottoms that we've been talking about on all those fangs, if uh, if we see Bitcoin give out to new lows, I don't see like I mean thirty thousand is a logical first target. But I mean you're it, it might not even it might blow through thirty thousand on the downside in a in a heartbeat. And you got guys like Kramer uh, pitching Ethereum. Like there's just uh, it like. Yeah, I know. The kiss of death. Did you see good old Kramer? I feel bad for the guy. He said, so what did he say? Facebook was going to blow. It was going to stink. And Google numbers were going to blow out. And it was the exact opposite. Google was down 8%. Poor guy. He's he's just, he's taking so so much heat now. Like, uh. (laughs) Listen. Maybe it's time for him to take the knee and uh... <laughs> yeah, maybe it's time to long go. By the way, are you saying uh, that uh, Bitcoin is like a shark, and if they don't stop moving, they're gonna die? Yeah, yeah. Oh no! Listen, like, because what what is the only thing that's been driving um, uh, crypto? It's been the fact that it's this uh, dream no, no. of easy money. It's no, got no, in on... Patrick, Patrick, it's the future, man. Well, you, even you just, if, okay, you don't but see even, it, man. Okay. This is going to replace fiat currency. Okay, no, you but do listen. not understand how. But, but 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 you know what? I I like the fact that you are being a dick <laughs> and and feeding me this shit. But but listen, the 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 thing is is that most people that are putting in all of their little excess money is on the fact that it's a 10 bagger. They need they need those returns. And the thing is is that the more it grinds, the more the story gets heavy. And uh and then it just uh, gravity takes over and the whole thing just it can feed on itself to the downside. Okay, people, not, I, for all those, you know, Bitcoin folks that think Patrick's full of shit and doesn't understand the new the new order and how it's all going to work, send him your hate mail. I'm not I'm ju- I'm not even I'm talking technicals. I'm just talking about the fact that if the uh, if the Bitcoin bulls are serious about taking it higher, they better gain some momentum. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Okay, all right, all right. So uh, let's talk uh, the gold, which has been taking a lot of heat uh, uh, for failing uh, to being uh, an asset that defends, uh, and that it should have been much be- uh, higher under these circumstances. But you know, I kind of look at it, and in a period where you look at those other cross currencies being destroyed and you look at what's going on in the whole market it's gold is weak because this is not an environment where gold does well but it could have been a lot worse oh yeah i was about to say for those for all the disappointed gold bulls out there i would say be thankful it's not much much worse real rates are going higher u.s dollars going higher those are like this is an two, environment are, that this is this could have been a bear market downtrend for gold. Yeah, in this kind of gold a could have been sixteen fifty and testing the bottom of the range real easy. And in fact, the fact that it's not leads me to believe that there's underlying strength much greater. Yeah, and and so that's uh, that's just in my mind uh, just worth. Li- that doesn't mean that it's imminently going higher. It doesn't mean that you got to go and load the boat. But it, but it, it just could have been a lot worse. And um, and you know the one thing that I I've been uh, doing is I've been building a lot of uh, very simple hedges in on my gold and it just allows me to kind of uh, uh, grind through some of this. I think once, once everything subsides, let, let's just uh, fantasize for a moment that the dollar has put in a short term high. Cause we don't know that for sure. It's just one reversal day. It's very premature to make any conclusion, but if the dollar suddenly comes off and rates just calm down, uh, 
and suddenly all of those headwinds uh, just uh, it's like uh, someone's been uh, stepping on the head of gold and, and sinking it underwater it's like when that pressure is off will it positively react uh, there's going to be a lot of really interesting puzzle pieces to solve uh, in the coming weeks if those things start to happen so I think gold leads us out of this next um, when we finally stop going down when the as you say right. when the Fed- I'm not going to object I have, I have too much of the shit so like yeah. uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, you know if you're uh, forecast comes true uh, it's uh, I'm not going to complain but, the, but um, it is gonna, it, it's not going to save you in the meantime and you're right there but if yeah. just not hurting you is is as good as not saving you yeah so I'm watching the seven and a half level on that gas buddy uh, to me this a lot of times okay so we, that gas went parabolic. It doubled in a month, right? Like it, it was ridiculous the advance it had. Um, it went through a very typical pullback. It was not even a 50% retracement. It, a very typical thing that happens after such a parabolic rise. And it's trying to break out again. To me, the seven and a half is the pivot, um, not from its previous high alone, but there's some fib levels in, uh, tucked in this area. And the way I look at it is that if there's another full leg higher in that gas, it's got to clear that 750 hurdle. Um, if it stalls out uh, at the seven and a half, uh, it increases the likelihood that at least some uh, short to intermediate high may be in. Uh, and I'm not yet uh, calling for that, but I'm watching early next week whether seven and a half is beaten. Okay, I'll do that. You'll do that. I'll watch it with you. Well, are you are you still in? Yeah, I still. I left the hole. I hold. I own my strip. It's such a pain for me to trade it out of my strip because I own every month for like two years. <laughs> so, like, so, so, it's your, so you got yourself in a, a, yeah, in a like total too... position because it's yeah. just too hard to unwind. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, why don't you just clip a couple of the front ends where all the action uh, is? So... Like, if you, once you go no, but once you go six months out, okay, yeah. let's talk about this because because like when you look at the term structure, right? Um, like when you let's say go one year out on the your uh, it's not on moving that as gas. much. Yeah, no, it's, I get well, it. no, but like the point is, is that the, the entire move has literally been uh, like it, even go to January. I think yeah, January is still up here, but like when you go to the, let's say summer of next year because you have two year strip, right? Yeah, uh, so. Let's say you go out um, to 2023, but let's say August. I mean, we're talking about $4 NAT gas. It's like 50% cheaper where the, than, than it is at the front of the curve where it is right now. Uh, it's, uh, you're, you're in a situation where if you hold the strip, why don't you just unwind the next six months and take some profits on that and hold your long-term position? Maybe. Or roll it out. Roll Maybe, out the front, but that's the, the kinda, front six to the back six. Uh, def- <sighs> Yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna sh- I'm gonna shut up. Uh, you you do what you want. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 trying to be a trend follower and hang in there. So of course it's gonna collapse. Yeah, but you're not. You're but you're you're but you're not uh, abandoning the position by taking advantage of the fact that there's a massive backwardation. Like literally the entire the, the entire 2022 strip is double the price of everything long term. Okay. So why not just uh, move I to the long term? I feel like the, anyway. it's a trade that's working. If anything, I should be doubling it on the long side instead of taking part of it off. But that's you know. All well, right. you could oh, that, no, but that's actually a great way to do it. You, you maybe you, you trim a little bit at the front and double down on the back. Uh, anyway, <laughs> kind of uh, like a mullet. You want me to put the mullet on? Put the mullet trade I, on. I got, that I got the bald <laughs> mullet going on. I got no hair at the top, and I'm going to grow the back end. That's what you want me to do. You want me? That's to go exactly. With I, the you're bald going for mullet. the full mullet. Kevin, I love you're it. You're the nat gas trader with the bald mullet. Okay, let's go on to the next thing here. Uh, I wanted to talk about this uh, uranium. And uh, okay, we talked about this last week. We're both buy on dips on this. Okay, let's just move on. Uh, you know what? All I just wanted to just well, we should touch- mention one second. Can I interrupt about the uranium? Yeah. It unfortunately was they tried to list it in New York, in New York, yeah, and it got it turned down. It got failed. I personally think that you shouldn't be buying something because it's going to get listed in New York. If the fundamental story is correct, then it doesn't matter where it's going to get listed. And it'll eventually go where it wants to go. All, and it all just, it it just sped it along. That's all that that might do. But if it's still a fundamentally bullish story, it's still a fundamentally bullish story. Okay, so, but you, you know what? I Okay, so uh, this is I'll agree with you. 
And but the question is, like, and, and this is the same people. Like, why would you want, let's say, gold ripping to five thousand if it was based on speculative thing versus fundamentals? In the same way with uranium, why if if it got listed on New York and your hope was that a bunch of speculators that now can access the market would uh, soak up all the excess uranium, then all it would lead is to a speculative blow off on uranium and crash it on the other end. The thing is, is that uh, why is this a good thing? I mean, unless you're uh, playing just a short game. Yeah. Uh, I, it, it, I, I think that's a great point, Patrick. I don't mean to interrupt, but it's a little bit like GameStop and on when those, yeah. when they were trying to squeeze the shorts. Yeah. Okay. You can squeeze the shorts, but ultimately you can't hold forever. Squeezing the shorts implies that you get it to a level that's beyond where it should be and that you eventually have to sell. And that was the part that everyone seemed to miss was fine. You're squeezing the shorts, but you got to sell. And the question is, if everyone tries to sell, there's no one that's going to fucking buy it up there. So yeah. it's going to just fucking go crashing down anyway. Yeah. So the why why do you want that volatility? By the way, do uh, you like, think some guys are going to go and get in trouble for GameStop? Like, do you think that Archie goes or Archie, I don't know how to say it, but Bill Wang and, and the crew. Yeah. Do you think that's the start of it and that there's more to come? Hmm. I do. You think so? Eh? Oh, yeah. I think yeah, the I, SEC has just started and I suspect he'll roll over and that there will be more and more of these things. We will look well, back yeah. and we will look at this period and go, and and it, well, you what, know, every people, bubble, every every bubble, uh, parabolic rise in a market has somebody that goes down for some stupid. I know, but Patrick, this was way worse. People well, I, I were couldn't... openly talking about committing securities fraud. I couldn't believe it. They would they would just say it, it was almost like a badge of honor. Yeah, and and, and it's like the crypto world. People talk about rug pulls and they blame the people for you know falling for the rug pulls. It it, yeah. it it changed the attitude, and it very much is a point where I think that the, the um the Securities and Exchange Committee is, uh, Commission is going to be there. They're just really, really slow. Yeah, well, I mean, they have to do things legally, right? Yeah, like, so it takes you, a you while. have to go like, through other like courts. Think about and... Bill Wine. There, you know, that was how long ago that they, you know, that that, that fell, that that was first announced. Now, yeah. Like, I still think that that other fellow that's very uh, vocal and has done different things, it's not, uh, everyone thinks, oh, that, that he's thumbing in the nose of the, the SEC and that they're never going to do anything to him. Could just be that they're taking their time and putting together a case. Yeah. Anyways, what uh, else you got listen, for us? Well, let's talk bonds. Well, oh, you know what? Uh, obviously, uh, you know, you wrote a piece talking about the idea that uh, the crash already happened. But one of the things that I'm looking for is a technical sign that the selling has subsided. So far, the pattern of lower highs and lower lows and a primary downtrend remains intact. I mean, they mastered up just a two-day reaction on the 10-year note and uh, immediately heading right back to the lows. A lot of the, uh, the technical characteristics that the prevailing trend is still the dominant one. Uh, one of the things I think I'm going to be watching next week is will we see you know uh, a little turtle head where, where it just pokes below its previous low and then swings back up and starts uh, to show that there's uh, um, uh, some sort of a little uh, kind of support line being established and that things have really calmed down. Because right now, if it gives out that previous low, um, it, technically, you know, one, 117 or 116 could still be in the cards. That would put on a, a yield basis, clearing 3%, no problem. <laughs> uh, and, again. <laughs> Sorry, I keep laughing. Patrick, did you call it a turtle head? Yeah, yeah, that's the reverse prairie dog. Do you it's know? Where, do you know what a turtle head is? Yeah. Okay, you do know. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> like right, you have a support line, and that little turtle head pokes down below, okay, as long as, and then pops back up. As long you know, as you so, know what a turtle head is, and you like you've gone to why would it, why would I use the pattern? Uh, like, okay, that's why I was confused about. I didn't know. I didn't realize. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big picture trading is actually a well-known pattern we follow really yeah yeah <laughs> you guys are classy <laughs> joint <laughs> <laughs> all right but anyway okay that on that note i think that's a uh, that's where we'll have to wrap it up for uh, for the talking charts is there any last <laughs> part that you want to <laughs> you have to go to the washroom is that why <laughs> okay <laughs> let's move on let's do <laughs> oh, All right. Okay, skin uh, in the game. So I got another one. I'm back yeah, to the yeah. old. The world, you know, the world has gone back to how it should be. 
Yeah, Patrick the dollar's going bear, up. Dollar's and, going up. Patrick's bearish as AF, and Kevin's winning all the the uh, the bets. The bets. So you know we're back. So what was it? It wasn't even close, right? Like, no, yeah, it was the uh, it was the home builders outperforming the S and P, and you said yes, and it wasn't even close. Like home builders were flat, and the S and P was getting its face ripped off. Like it's um, it, you won. Okay, you won. So let me tell That's, people uh, about this game. Uh, uh, skin in the game is our weekly opportunity for us to demonstrate that we are degenerate gamblers at heart. Every week, one of us presents a wager, and the other guy chooses which side of the bet he wants. Every wager needs to settle by next episode, and the currency for the wagers is as follows. A McKenzie and a McKenzie, which is like a Duke and Duke Canada style. A pint of beer, a burger bet, a pitcher, case of beer, bottle of wine, steak dinner, and the winner of the bet is obligated to create a new bet for the following week. All wagers settle in full, and there will be no netting of positions. No netting. No netting. Physical okay. delivery. Physical okay. delivery. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to do the yen. Oh. Yeah. And Against the U.S. dollar, right? Yeah, U.S. dollar, yen. And we're going to do one touch. Oh. And I am going to say um, 123.06. Oh, wait. One, next week. What is a typical week here? Let's look at this. A typical week is... You realize, okay, we're we're talking yen at one twenty nine seventy five. Right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm just trying to think of what a week is. So a week, so a week is generally. Let me put on a weekly chart for you. Here. Okay, that's good. That's that's fair. Okay, so there we go. So a week is generally what three handles? About five uh, five hundred pips. You think it's five hundred? Nah, look at this. Well, uh, this 20... week, this this past week, it was. Uh, yeah, it was 427 pips the week before. It was, uh, yeah, okay, 500 too much. Uh, it, it was uh, 325 pips. Yeah, so it's, uh, this was a, uh, yeah, let's, uh, I would say about 350 pips on average. Okay. For this, uh, since the rip started, that okay, is. Okay, so one touch, 124.11. Um, okay, I, I'll say it won't. Okay, I'm taking, I'm taking the t- one touch. All right. All right. That's a that's probably one twenty four eleven. Yeah. Okay. Lena, write that one down. Okay. Well, you think that's like listen? I actually think it, you uh, it's gonna you're right about the direction, but that's a pretty you you made a pretty bold. I know. Move. I know. That's why I was trying because I but if I'd gone any less, you wouldn't have done it. Yeah, I wouldn't have done it. Like I think you 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 gave me a lot of wiggle room to to be right. All right. So uh, what do you want to bet? Well, we just got to get our our. Our pictures of your yeah, get, well, yeah. Since since we now solidified the date, just yeah. a reminder: June first, book your tickets. Uh, book your well. There's uh, no tickets uh, to time book. With, well, but well, not yeah, not with us. But uh, you got to get the hall pass from the uh, the, oh, the partner, the significant and, other, and the and and the flights. And it's definitely happening, no matter what. No matter no what. matter what, we're going out. We're drinking a lot of beer. unless I miss my flight from Lisbon. No, and then it'll be just me and Lena. <laughs> exactly. It'll be all the better. No, you're there not going to you miss your flight because you're. I'm in not going to miss. I'm, I'm going to. I'm there. I'm there. Yeah. I'm no, there. it's going to be June first. Actually, I'm, it's gonna, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be good. It's yeah. Gonna so be it'll be a lot of fun. Hopefully, it's nice weather. All right, Lena, yeah. hop on and let's do some. Help uh, us out with these no stupid yeah, questions. Yeah, no stupid questions. <laughs> let's see what kind of questions All we right. got this week. So, hey guys, two questions for the team. One, what are the tactics in- institutional investors use to leg in and leg out of a large positions? How can the little guy exploit them? Two, the volatility and widespreads on smaller well, ETFs. Well, actually, why don't we just answer one at a time first? Okay, uh, sure. Just, uh, why don't I take like, that one get, since I probably yeah, have more of the institutional? Um, the reality is that when, a, when a, an institution has to trade size, there's no real tactics to be had because – they have to move the stock to to or the security to get any size done. So when you when a small uh, retail investor wants to buy something, he would generally go just pay the offer and maybe they move through the offer um, a penny or two to get his full fill. Uh, for an institution to get a full fill, it, it will take days, sometimes weeks. Like I remember when I was on the desk that like Fidelity would come and sell. And they would sell a stock. Think for, of the selling in. Think of the selling in uh, the, um, Netflix. The, um, Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. It, they that's, could, a, that's institution having to dump. Yeah, and they could sell for weeks, literally yeah. weeks. So sometimes an institutional say, "Well, I don't want to move the stock. I'm going to only sell on ups 
or I, I, I'm going to try to be only a certain portion of the volume. You will see that's a very common uh, constraint that they'll put. They'll say, I'm going to do a VWAP, which is volume weighted average price, which means you just participate at all levels, but I don't want to be more than 10% of the volume or something of that nature. Uh, and that is kind of a passive approach to getting off a big position. And, and the reality is that you just have to passively move along with the market and continually sell, 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 or buy, 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 buy. And you just participate till it's done. In the old days, there used to be more of block trading, meaning that an institution might phone up and say, I want to buy X million of something, and where do you offer it? And maybe the broker themselves would offer it, or they would go and canvas and make a block. Uh, I'll tell you one funny story. I remember in my day that Nortel was a big trader, and they could, we got an order to buy uh, on our main desk, and I you know, Norto was $150 stock and, and Fidelity, I think it was Fidelity, phoned up and said, here, go buy a million. And they just, they didn't even put a price on it. They said, buy the million. And they phoned back uh, kind of half an hour later and they said, how, how's it going with, you know, where's my fill? And the, and the trader said, well, I bought you 322000 Here's your price. And they said, what? And they said, you know, that was just the start of the order. And they wanted it immediately. And they were like, go get it in. And they, that was one million of many millions. And sometimes what they would do is they would, instead of doing that, they'd just say, where do you offer 5 million Nortel or whatever? And we would offer it up $4. And then we would try to play a game to see if you could get the liquidity. But often the reality is that the, the, the client knew that there was no liquidity. And that's why they were asking you and willing to pay that price through the market because they did it. They knew that they weren't going to be able to get it. But having said that, that rarely occurs anymore. Most of the time now, it's all VWAP or time-weighted average price. And that's what they do. And that's why you have these markets to trend one way all day and just keep going more and more and more. And the other thing in question is, how do they hide it? They have trouble hiding it. And that's why people like Jim Simmons, uh, Renaissance Capital, make so much money because everyone sees it and, uh, and front runs it. I don't know. Hope yeah. that answers the question. But the thing is, is how does a little guy exploit it? Oh, yeah. Bottom, sorry. Uh, and, you know, but, the, but one thing I would just simply say is, is okay, listen, so, uh, if you're super smart and nimble, you can go and try to catch an edge on this stuff. But I think that there's better ways of making money as a small guy than trying to uh, take advantage of the big uh, force selling of big institutions. Well, one, and, but okay. I'll push back a little bit on that, Patrick. Okay. And then I will say, in my day when I first started off trading, stocks were often much more um, up and down, and you would try to sell. You would sell big rallies because they would often come back in in a correction. And nowadays, especially when it comes to day trading, because of the so the there are so many VWAP and TWAP orders, the reality is the pattern is often stock opens goes straight up one or two percent off the open and then grinds another higher for the rest of the day. And at the very least, maybe you're not taking advantage of it, is, but be aware that those type of orders exist, and that is a pattern that plays out time and time and time again, and it has to do with the preponderance of t VWAP and TWAP orders by institutions. Right. Okay, number two. So number two from this listener, the volatility and widespreads on smaller ETFs can make risk management with stops and options difficult. Stops are always getting run and options are expensive. I've been long URNM since it was back at $30, but price action has bucked me off a few times and I've given back a lot of the delta by allowing myself to get stopped out and not having the courage to get back on the horse before the ensuing parabolic rise. Is the best strategy here just to hodl? How can you? How can a sole trader avoid being fodder for the hedgies? Cheers, Avid Hudler. All right. Well, I'll start, and then you can okay. kind of give feedback on it. Well, first of all, the the first thing I can uh, identify in the way that this was worded was uh, you might be trading too big and too tight on your stops. Yeah. Um, Hundred percent uh, agree, Patrick. The uh, I mean, the, the if you if you're uh, on a, some, you have to kind of step back and recognize how volatile the URNM is. I mean, uh, you're talking 50 plus implies all the time on this thing and sometimes shooting up uh, uh, even way higher than that. And so when you have such high implies, the daily uh, swings higher and lower are extraordinary. Uh, and the thing is trying to keep stop losses within any small tight range is you're just putting yourself uh, just to be pecked 
off from the daily intraday volatility, then options, while you're, uh, one would say is are expensive, but are they really with this kind of with that kind of volatility? Question I'd ask is, are they right priced? The thing, the thing I've seen those URNM uh, options. Uh, I think the big, the it's not necessarily that they're expensive, but they they have wider spreads. So I think the wider spreads on the options might be a bigger deterrent. But I don't necessarily think that those options are mispriced in terms of being expensive. Um, anyway, so like uh, I just think that the trader just needs to this this listener needs to trade a little bit smaller and be more decisive about uh, the primary trend that they're trying to capture. What yeah. Would you add well, to I would add. Remember when we had Jerry Parker um, from Chesapeake Capital on? He talked about what he would do is he'd look at a trend, and he would say, "What did? What was the breakout? What were the parameters that needed for me to stay in this trend?" And he would almost work backwards. So my suggestion to you would be: What are the stops that would enable me to not be, uh, or what would those stop levels that would enable me not to be continually stopped out? And as Patrick says, that the chances are that means that the stops are going to be wider and therefore to keep the same P&L uh, discipline that you're hopefully doing for your portfolio, it means you have to trade smaller. So I, I think Patrick nailed it. All right. So uh, next one, Lena. He's doing a lot of nailing in this episode. Oh, that's right. He's <laughs> nailing the, the, the coffins. <laughs> <laughs> okay, second second listener question here. Hey guys. <laughs> What's the difference between buying a 10-year treasury bond and a 10-year future? Is there a major difference in the PNO if the future was rolled at each expiry versus holding the 10-year bond to maturity? I'd imagine there's some duration mismatch that would make replicating a hold to maturity approach a little complicated. Also related to that, are the coupons on treasury futures just embedded in the price? So the interest income on cash bonds would essentially be capital gains slash losses on futures? If that's the case, wouldn't futures probably be a better vehicle for people in higher income brackets than cash bonds? Appreciate your insights as always. Okay, so I'm going to do this one. It's Kev. Yep. Um, let's start with the first question. Is there a major difference in the P&L if the future was rolled at each expiry versus holding the 10-year bond to maturity? Yes, they're completely different, and they're different in that the first year when you're doing it or the first expiry when you're doing it, what's happening is the duration is matched. But then when you hold your 10-year bond and you go to roll the next quarter, your 10-year bond is now a nine and three quarters, but yet they're, your um, future is still a 10-year. Now, it's not quite this clean because the reality is a 10-year bond future has a different duration and stuff. But I'm just going to, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to explain it this way. So every time you roll it, you're rolling a 10-year future and it, your bond is going down and down and down and down and down in, in terms of its duration. So eventually, five years from then, you would have a five-year future and, sorry, a five-year bond that was originally a 10-year but it would now become a five-year, and yet you're rolling a 10-year future. Now, you could duration match that, but then you have curve risk. So, that, so yes, that's the, the answer to your question is it is much different. Um, now, the next, uh, you, uh, next question is about the idea of whether the interest and the coupons from the Treasury bond are embedded in the futures price. And the real, and the 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 the, the Answer to your question is yes. And the, the reason is that if there wasn't, somebody would arbitrage this. This is actually a very easy and cheap market to arbitrage in that the amount of capital that you need to put up for treasury bonds is very minimal. And the amount of capital that you need to put up even for the cash bond, they're easily tradable. They're easily, they could be used as collateral. So this market is extremely tight. And if there was even a slight deviance, there would be the traders that are going and taking advantage of it. And in fact, there are people that try to trade the fact that there are slight nuances because a treasury future is deliverable into different um uh, issues, different different types of bonds, and there is what's known as a conversion factor. And yet, so the reality is, as the curve moves around in the slightest, minutest way, you can have a situation where the treasury future might do better or worse than the cash bonds. And although for someone that's trading this and just trying to own the exposure to bonds, it's not that big a deal, it might mean, you know, four or five ticks 
on something that's moving around 400 ticks. It doesn't matter. But if you own thousands and thousands and tens of thousands and maybe even hundred thousands of these things versus the underlying bonds, this is actually a way to make money. Our good friend Morris Sachs, who used to be at Greenwich Capital, and he has that podcast uh, Inside Baseball with Old Chestnut. This is what he did for a living. He sat there and he went and would trade bonds against the futures, and they would look for arbitrages between those. So then the next question is about the the kind of the different tax rates. And I'm not going to give tax advice. Go consult your tax uh, uh, advisor, but don't forget that. Um, bonds and futures are sorry futures are taxed at a different rate than the underlying bonds and i would say though that if you're asking whether that part of it is perfectly hedged i mean not hedged arbitraged out it probably isn't because if you think about a lot of let's just say high net worth individuals they feel comfortable going out and buying a million dollars of a 10-year bond and just letting it sit in their account if you went and tried to explain to them, no, you're better off buying the 10 year bond future and rolling it every quarter, A, it takes a lot more work, and then B, there's a level of sophistication. So there might be an opportunity for a high net worth individual to have a better tax rate using futures. I'm not sure, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if that is the case. All right. Uh, and the last one? Last question. Hey, guys, I've noticed over the last few weeks, as things have gotten crazy in the commodity space, a lot of ETFs have closed a few percent above or below NAV on a number of occasions. This has happened in everything from GLD to USO to UNG. So I figured I would start tracking NAV throughout the day to inform my trading decisions. But whenever I try to calculate NAV in the middle of a tra trading session, the ETF price never seems to deviate from NAV. But after the close, when I look back at an ETF's website, it will then sometimes say that indeed the price closed 2 to th 2 or 3% away from NAV. Calculating NAV doesn't seem like rocket science, and I am pretty sure I'm doing the math correctly. So is there something I'm missing here, or do I just need to enroll in an online math course for 10th graders? And when are you guys going to announce the date of the piss-up already? I'm very thirsty. We got the date already. So... Um, <laughs> Here, here's what I would say ab about this is that if you're looking at it throughout the day and it's bang on, then you're probably doing your math spot on correct. And the fact that it's not closing at the same proper um, uh, premium or, or, or kind of relationship to NAV probably has more to do with the different closing prices. So, for example, uh, if you go look at gold, gold will close at 230 or 220. I can never remember. Those commodity folks always do stuff in weird, in weird times. It closes at 230, and then the, the actual GLD will close at 4 o'clock. And so if you're using the official price on the actual if, – if the company is using the official price of both closes on the website – then it might appear that there was an arbitrage there or that it wasn't spot on nav. But when you actually went to trade them at those specific times, it was spot on. So my best guess is that that's what you're experiencing and that you're actually, you know, more correct than you think. One way to double check it is to check the closing prices and figure out where they're getting the closing prices and see if they correspond to what you're expecting the closing prices to be. Oh my God, it's almost like you know what you're talking about. It's almost okay. like I did so, that for a living for a while. Yeah, I know, weird, eh? Yeah. Anyway, Lena, where can people submit their questions? So if you have any questions for Kevin and Patrick, please submit your questions to no stupid questions at markethuddle.com. All right, thanks for tuning in to the Market Huddle. We appreciate you st spending some time with us. Please give us a follow out there on Twitter at the Market Huddle. You can listen to the Market Huddle on all the networks, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Android Play, iTunes, and YouTube. A lot of people watch on YouTube to see all of our charts and visuals. And while you're there, please like and subscribe to get our latest content. Patrick, where can they find you? You can find me at bigpicturetrading.com and follow me on Twitter at Patrick Ceresdine. Where can they find you, bud? I'm on Twitter at Kevin Muir, or you can check out my newsletter at themacrotours.com. And listen, you can never have, we can never have too many friends. Bear market, bull market, we're just happy together to, to spend some time together on this crazy ride. Now stick around for the after show. You stumbled there. I buddy. stumbled. No, it's, uh, I stumbled at the beginning. It's all the same <laughs> shit. It's, uh, well, I'm just happy that I'm actually feeling 100. percent This is the first one that I felt 100. percent Oh, I'm glad you're back. Buddy. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure a bunch of our listeners are too. It's you know, it always sucks being, uh, uh, and you know what? 
Anyway. Yeah. I'm still Cheers, waiting buddy. for the chlamydia. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, Patrick, Let's, let me. what do you got going for the beer? You got to rate this bad boy. <sighs> okay. So, um, I have to say, uh, okay. So, this here t- is uh, just a standard Pilsner. If you put the Labatt Blue label on this, I wouldn't have been able to tell the difference. And because I paid a craft beer uh, price for this to drink a beer that tastes like a Labatt Blue, it's uh, it's a big fail. Like uh, oh, wow. I'm uh, like you know it's drinkable. I, I didn't hate it, but uh, I'm 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 gonna give it a 4.9. Oh I'm going my under goodness! The five. That's, no, you know what? It's it's because bad. it's. It, it's because it it's supposed to be craft beer. It's supposed to have some. It was just so ordinary and sweet. Oh. It was sweet like Labatt Blue. It was. Oh. You think Labatt Blue is sweet? Yeah, it's that, that Pilsner <laughs> sweetness. It's gross. It's uh, like like there's great Pilsners out there, but uh, Labatt Labatt Blue. Labatt Blue. But uh, no, you know what? This is a fail. Okay, well, that is an uh, interesting score, and I like how it is very sophisticated. It's no longer on the numbers. Speaking about on the numbers, I saw that Dave Portnoy came to Toronto. Yes. <laughs> and he went to the my pizza place. Your pizza place. Yeah, that's, that's the one I, 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 right I, I had, oh, I had no idea. Go. I had here no idea go. it was your pizza place. But you know who? Um, you know who introduced me to it? Actually, it wasn't you, but uh, well, it was Jon Snow. No, listen, uh, I talked to you about this place ages ago. You just don't listen. I probably didn't listen, yeah. but uh, but uh, like uh, John Snow. Uh, for those who don't know who John Snow is, uh, it was uh, a joke. But a guy that came to our um, Chicago piss up as a good buddy of mine, and uh, and uh, basically that's his pizza joint. He like would bring it to our rum shack sessions, and uh, oh, it's we would, uh, It's like when and, it's, and, it's, and, like I think on it's the a nonstop. We would be, yeah. And it's it's interesting that Dave Portnoy went there first, and that was the first place he hid in Toronto. I thought it was kind of uh, shit how he gave it an eight four because he was talking it up a lot, and then he gives it an eight four. I'm like, that's lame. That, that's that's Canadian uh, discrimination. Yeah, but if that's an American score, then does that give us like a ten out of ten? <laughs> Right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Lena I, with the sharp wit. I love it. Let's figure it out. Let's let's do actually the math. Let's the exchange a, rate. Yeah, let's do the exchange rate. What's one point two four eight right now? So eight point four times one point two the exchange rate. Eight four eight. Shit, it's a ten seven nine. It's the world's highest score. Oh, there you go. Yeah. It, <laughs> it's 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 like spinal tap with the thing going to eleven. <laughs> right. It's like <laughs> It's, all- it's like everyone else has scored between 1 to 10, but uh, Toronto Pizza goes all the way to 11. <laughs> it is a good joint, though. Like, it's really good. Like, it's a really great place. And those of you that are coming to the Piss Up here on June 1st and want to hit a great pizza joint. Yeah. Well, the- or if you're here and you actually have never tried it, go take the time out to go give it a whirl. North of Brooklyn, yeah. it's called. And it's, a, it's really great. Alina, have you had it? No, I actually haven't. Oh, there you go. There's there's a crazy one. They have something north of Brooklyn, and let me just pull up their menu. And well, we know Alf, um, you know Alf would be really upset with the things that we do to our pizzas. But um, let's just look here. I think they've got some crazy one that's got Killer Bee. Here we go. Listen to this. Oh, I should have told Alfonso, but Alfonso about this because yeah. he would have died. Uh, <laughs> mozzarella. Calabrese sausage, jalapenos, pickled red onions, oregano, and then here's the real kicker, honey. Uh, no, it's a delicious pizza. Have you had it? I've, I've had yeah. honey on pizza before. Uh, you know, I didn't think I was going to like this thing, and I liked it. It was actually pretty yeah. good. Killer beer. I mean, the honey called. is just a sweetener on the top, but it's, yeah. it's a great pizza. It, like, it's with... fine on your pizza. It's not good in your beer. <laughs> yeah. No. But I just, <laughs> I just go over the tra- anyways. Great pizza, um, I go check it out. Anyone see anything interesting or have anything nope. new to report, Patrick? How I watched nope. Batman. Nope. Oh, you went to Batman? Yeah, I, 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 we rented it at home. Oh, how was it? I didn't want to go to the theater. It was good. Like I was kind of skeptical about it, but it was good. But um, I just, I just don't buy uh, what's his name, Robert Pattinson as Batman. I just don't buy him as Bruce Wayne. Oh. Who is? I don't even know. There's a new Batman. Yeah, it's not, George, Batman. It's not George Clooney anymore. Oh my god! 
At least I didn't say Mr. Mum Guy. What's that guy's name? Um, Mr. Mum Guy. Yeah, you don't even know who it is. I don't know. Um, Michael Keaton. Oh. oh. I liked Michael Keaton as Batman. Well, that was oh, the original. That was even before George Clooney. Yeah. But Batman, yeah, this... Birdman, whatever. He's like fucking he's, he's, Keaton. Yeah, he's got wings. That's, that's this guy's got wings? No, no. <laughs> Michael Keaton. He's Batman, Birdman. He's got wings. Oh, yeah. He's Birdman. And That's he's Vulture and what is that other Spider-Man movie or yeah. whatever? Well, I liked yeah, him I in that, the him. movie about the, the drug recently. He's the doctor that gets hooked on... on uh... Oh, the, the TV show. Yeah. We the, talked about yeah, this. Yeah, no, that was such, he did such a good job. He really did a good job uh, um, kind of uh, acting in that. The one thing I will say, Mr. Mom has this one great scene when someone comes to his house early in the morning and they say, he says, you know, I think it's maybe like somebody checking up on his, um, whether he's doing a good job as a dad with the kids and he offers him a beer and the guy says it's 8.30 in the morning and then uh, Mr. Mom, Michael Keaton says, scotch? Like he asks him a question, <laughs> like it's scotch. And I saw that good old um, Jimmy Jude used that in, in uh, on Twitter the other day. And I was like, oh, Jimmy Jude, he's a man after my heart. That's a great scene. People forget about that yeah. one. You, you know, uh, but let's let's talk about because I mean he he was Beetlejuice. He he had all those early movies, and um, and at the time I uh, I was a big fan of him, and I was a big fan of Nick Cage at the same time. And boy, did uh, um, one age well and the other uh, spoil quite. Uh, which one's lot. which? <laughs> <laughs> no, Mike Keaton's been holding it up, but like Nick Cage has been uh, just. Well, he's like, a little off the rails. He is off the rails. Okay, so he's like, got he... some new movie where he plays himself. There's a movie where he plays <laughs> yeah. himself? Oh, you didn't know this. No, what is this? I can't remember. Let's just look. Like, he literally plays himself and uh, like going off the rails. Like, it's. it's. Let me just see here. Um, well. Wasn't At least he, doing he owns it. A lot of it. shitty movies because he owed a lot of money to. Oh yeah, yeah, the guys. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, what is it? Where is it? The un- unbearable weight of massive talent. I believe that's it. And I think he, I think he ends up in this movie doing jobs that he shouldn't do because he owes a lot of money. <laughs> he basically says his life story. His biopic. Yeah, like this. Yeah, he's done it. Uh, now he does have those national Trevor treasure movies. <laughs> and listen, he's yeah. got two really good movies, and I'm gonna I'm gonna let you guys don't t- don't say face off. You're gonna say face I off. I was gonna say face off. That's Jesus gonna, Christ! Was great with him. Oh in my it. That's God! Great. That's, on a air. Great, Come that's on. a great movie, Patrick. Face off is a great movie. What do you think the number two is? <sighs> and you can't say Con Air because it's not. Well, I already mentioned Connor, so I'm not Okay. Going to. What do you think it is? He's got one really good serious movie where it was a really good movie. <gasps> Adaptation? No. Was it that one Sean Connery one? No, it was with him and one woman that might have been a woman that uh, would have been that right like? around my age that would have been uh, when you were 16 years old that people fall in love with her. Leaving Las Vegas. You got it. Elizabeth okay, Shue. I remember you mentioning her before. Yeah, I'll... I'll uh, I'll give you that one. Leaving Las Vegas was a truly terrific that, that's, movie. And, and yeah. for those that are younger... But, he, but I'm just saying he didn't age well. At the time, he was great. Like I, I was a big fan of his uh, back when I was uh, a young uh, young pup. But um, yeah, he just... Have you guys been watching any of this uh, Johnny Depp disposition? I, I just to, on I Twitter I saw some of the just some of the things that, that was uh, hilarious. At least a little. Uh, I watched a thirty second bit on um, on Twitter. That's all I've what an from embarrassment it, I that these, these, this couple is airing all this in in public. What is so, what is the basis of this? That he's suing her, right? Yeah, I think that she. Uh, what did he? Uh, she accused him of battery, which then ruined his career. So he's suing her. For defamation. for defamation or something, okay. but it's just like it's just a disaster. Like, oh. I thought I heard that she beat him, not the other. Yeah, way around. well, the other thing is that she dated uh, Elon, and Elon had a black eye at a certain point as well, too. <gasps> oh, Listen, they're probably did. all idiots. Like they're probably all idiots. It's the reality, right? I mean, she is beautiful. The uh, on the outside, I don't. They're, know the, they're the most that. dangerous ones. Yeah. No. <laughs> she, she is beautiful. I think. <laughs> The uh, anyways, it's just embarrassing though how how they're doing it all in public. 
Like it, it's just crazy. And, and, and Johnny Depp is kind of like a smart aleck. So when you hear yeah. it all, like it's just oh gosh. You know one so thing what I did, he, didn't realize about what Johnny, does he want out of this? Sorry, go ahead, Lena. What does he want out of the loss? Like what does he want? Fifty bucks. Like fifty million. That's what he wants. Fifty million dollars. Does she even have fifty million dollars to give? Oh, I don't know. It doesn't matter. He's going to bankrupt her. It's just it's a whole point of. Oh shit! It's pretty. It's, it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty hilarious. Well, so let's look. Johnny Depp Amber Heard network. Let's see. Um, Didn't she get famous because of him? No, though? no, no. She was famous before. What was she in before? I feel like I only heard of her because of no, him. No, really? Then she, okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I. I don't remember seeing her in anything. No, I think let's just see here. Let's let's go. Let's pull up the IMDb. I think you're gonna have heard of her before. Uh, she's from Austin, Texas, and it, two okay, Friday Night Lights. She started in uh, oh, the OC. Yeah. She was in an episode. Let's see where she got really Californication. So she's still doing shitty TV at this point. Uh, the Playboy Club. What was that? Paranoia. Uh, oh, you're right. She's basically done nothing. Um, the Stand. Oh, that's where I know her from. Isn't the Stand the one that we watch? Uh, the the kind of uh, Stephen King thing recently. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh. Well. Anyways, who knows? So you're right. She really hasn't done much. Yeah. Yeah. Like I was. She's not like a a list actress. Yeah. So you're probably right. Well, although the Adderall diary sounds pretty interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Just for that, I'm going to go watch Amber Heard movies all weekend. <laughs> Just because you said that. Yeah. Yeah, she dated on Johnny right. Depp, though. I'm sorry. She dated uh, Elon, T- uh, Elon Tusk after that. So Elon it's Tusk. Musk. I know. Musk. I'm just kidding because Elon Tusk was in Rick and Morty. You know, Patrick, you, that's a show you should get into. I watch Rick and Morty. Oh, you do? I didn't realize that. Yeah, no, like, but I, you know what? I, I uh, watch it like uh, whenever someone else is kind of watching it, I kind of peek over. I've never actually started an episode on my own will, but I, whenever I'm watching it, it's hilarious. I, like, I, I need I, my I son to show. kind of explain things to me, like, because a lot, yeah. there's a lot of inside jokes, and you're just like, oh my goodness. And then every now and then, though, there's an episode where there's jokes that he doesn't get, and I explain them to him. Oh, that rare me. moment! The rare right? moment when they when they yeah, when I they can... do the boomer jokes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. The this rare, is one for rare. you, Dad. Yeah, I, just, <laughs> kind of I think this is so funny when they when they call everybody okay boomer like to obvious Gen X's, and I realize it's just like a complete like put down, but it's it's it's, it's so good. It's such a good put down because like you want to go explain yourself. Oh no, I'm not a, actually a boomer, and then you just look like a jerk. So you gotta just you gotta just take it. You gotta just be quiet. There's no winning. <laughs> it's like when someone calls you a small, you know, whatever. You, you have a small unit. You can't win to that. Because there's like, uh, for those who don't know, guys do this to other guys all the time. And the moment you go start to go that, there's all these lines. And once you start defending, yeah, yourself, exactly. You just look like you actually do. So you can't. There's nothing to say. You just block away. It's like I win. <laughs> that's the, that's the equivalent. Okay, well, Patrick wants to get out and have some fun, and Lena would like to get this taped up. So, have a great week, everyone. Thanks for taking. Yeah, have in. a great weekend. And uh, we'll. All see. right. Yeah, it was a, it was a great episode. Have a have a great weekend, everyone. And it was awesome. Cheers, everyone. Take care. Bye bye.